we need to get inflation back to target first, and I think that is the risk. The Fed is at this tenuous point. They need to make sure inflation doesn't reignite. We're at the end of the rate hiking cycle in the West. It really is once that economic data has deteriorated and you're in a cut cycle that you start to worry about those big downsides. If the economy stays strong, you know, there is the risk that the Fed might have to hike more and do more work to, to get the slowing that they need. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Let's get your week started live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500 virtually unchanged so, coming into another big week on Thursday. Earnings from Apple, from Amazon on Friday. It's payrolls Friday. TK, we start this morning over in Japan. BOJ making a move on Friday, making another move this morning. Another move this morning, and picking up the pieces, and all you do is watch the data. 142.29 yen is sort of midland, midpoint. Not the drama, maybe, that people would expect strong yen down to 139, 138. It didn't happen. But I'm watching I'm watching euro yen take out the dollar. 156.95 shows strong euro at weekend. Am I watching it? Yeah. But what I'm really watching, John, is the flow of data this week. And I'm putting Apple and others like that. That, that ilk reporting is economic data as well. Without a doubt. We have to build on the strategic ambiguity of last week from the ECB, the Federal Reserve, and for that matter, including the Bank of Japan as well. At least for a reduction in clarity to somehow maximize optionality across these central banks. And you asked a question on Friday, where is the line in the sand for a Bank of Japan that basically doubled their yield target for a 10-year Treasury? We <clears> kind <throat> of found an answer overnight. 0.6%. That's the line in the sand. Then they're going to come in and buy as much as they possibly can. So here's the question going forward. How much does the central bank really matter of Japan, of Europe, of the U.S.? And how much is it the data that Tom is talking about? How much is it the earnings that we're going to get this week? So is that the line or does the line move? Was that about the pace? Are they gray lines, Tom, and they move around? I, yeah, they're going to blink I on inflation. I can't make my mind up today. Let's, is that about the pace up. of the move we saw in the last <clears throat> day or so, or is that about a level that we saw? <laughs> I was on sabbatical Friday, so I missed all the festivities. I emailed India. You know, mm. I got a paper due on this. The provost emailed me. I, I can't wait to I see gotta, it. I got to do a paper off the sabbatical, but just a long sabbatical. But, but within that, John, is a big announcement from the Bank of Japan. And what this is about is imputing inflation into their system Oops, they've got a little bit too much inflation right now. They're trying to manage the inflation story. I would say history says that's very difficult to do. I don't think you do. can dial it with that you can't much dial accuracy, it. Yeah, right? You I, sort of I'm, turn the volume right. up and down on it. We'll come back to that story a little bit later. Equity futures, as I say, pretty much unchanged on the S&P 500. Into the bond market, yield shaping up as follows. Higher by three basis points, just in and around 4% going into payrolls on Friday. In the FX market, the euro, just a little stronger. Euro dollar right here, Lisa, 110.32. And you said rightly so. It is about the week ahead. It is a massive week. I would say arguably more important than what we saw from the central bankers because the data matters. Today, we get the Fed Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey at 2 p.m. SLUs. Later in the week, Manufacturing and Services PMIs. To me, the fact that Jim Reed of Deutsche Bank said, for those of us who believe old-fashioned metrics of the cycle matter, then the quarterly Fed SLUs later today could actually be the most informative for where the economy might be in 6 to 12 months. This week's labor market data is also important. Jolts on Tuesday, ADP on Wednesday, which doesn't matter until it does, productivity on Thursday, and Friday, the jobs report at a time where the unemployment rate is still flatlining, even though yeah. supposedly we're going to get inflation right. under control. It's a great summary, Lisa. To me, the key statistic is a survey is 200,000, 200 on jobs day. And that's still essentially it's a fully employed America. I mean, we're just not breaking down. And this is a really the tension. Is the disinflation a natural and soft landing or is this signs of cracks under the surface and the earnings this week? Yes, Amazon and Apple on Thursday, but 169 S&P 500 companies are reporting, including AMD, Starbucks, Uber, Airbnb, Marriott. Will it all be Amazon and Apple whose shares have driven a lot of the gains to date, Tom? Yeah, today gains have been absolutely phenomenal. Amazon up by close to 60% Apple. Apple, that stealth rally of more than 50% so far in 2023. Joining us now is Brian Levitt, global market strategist over at Invesco. Brian, I was thinking back to a conversation we had several months ago, and you referred to yourself as a FOMO guy, someone who wanted to buy these tech names when everyone else was calling them just a bubble and a rally that wouldn't sustain itself. Brian, where are you now on that call, given that a lot of people are starting to say, OK, it's a bull market, we might have to live with it, but perhaps we can look elsewhere. Are you looking elsewhere? 
Yeah, I think you, you start to look elsewhere at these, and that's actually healthy. The market is broadening. It's it's moving into other more value-oriented parts of the market, the, the cyclical names, smaller caps. So it's not just the, the very you know narrow market that you saw, call it March, April, May. You're actually getting a sign from markets that uh, this is healthier and there's more participants. And so far, the, the earnings for the value-oriented companies have been quite good. Brian, are things getting less bad or is the outlook for earnings actually improving? Uh, I think that things are moderating. I mean, that's what you would expect in this part of the cycle. But I think what a lot of investors missed is that the market priced it last year. I mean, you know, 11 months ago, we were down 9% so uh, in a month so uh, or 13 months ago, I should say. So that was a, a market that... Um, had already assessed what was likely to be a, a, a weak economic environment because of all of the tightening. And yet the economy has been more resilient than many expected. I think where people worry a bit is the valuations on the broad market, but that is in a, a handful of names. And, and you start to think about this broadening out, the names that have not been bid up are starting to participate more again, which is healthy. you got to participate, Brian Levitt, but I would suggest what you've got to do is extend your timeline. Where's the new Levitt terminal value? I mean, it used to be seven years, five years. But if I'm going to buy Apple here or all these other fancy stocks, do I have to extend out my terminal value to justify acquisition of those shares now? Well, some of those names are trading at, at quite elevated valuations. So you want to be, you know, a little bit um, cautious in the near term. But yeah, I mean, if you're thinking about the the structural themes that these companies are are taking advantage of, those are long term stories. So you, know, you think about the AI trade, you get a, a a bit of euphoria around that AI trade. I mean, we saw that in the late '90s too, with some names around the internet. But if you pick the right names um, over the multi year period, right. you did quite well. It's about avoiding the euphoria and, and looking at the true fundamentals. Are you tilting, it's a dangerous question for Invesco, are you tilting active management or passive management at this time? I think it's both. Um, but in an environment where you're seeing a broadening out, you should see more opportunity in, in active management. And what you, what you would expect as you move into you know, the next phase, so when we think about a new market cycle, a recovery phase of a cycle, that's when smaller caps do really well. That's when international does really well. And, and in a lot of those places, that's where um, investors can uh, can really take advantage of active. I also see a lot of money going into money markets. We've all seen that. And, you know, personally, I think yields start to come down over time. So there is reinvestment risk there. And I would I would advise investors to look further out in duration or to look further out in things like munis or corporate bonds, where, of course, uh, active management can serve you well. Basically, don't fight the momentum. You said, we make hay while the sun shines. And we heard from <laughs> Peter Scheer over the weekend, don't fight consensus in December and August. And that seems to be where we are. When does momentum stop working? I think you'll see the, uh, you know, the, when all of this tightening starts to find its way into the economy, you'll see the economy uh, roll over a bit, whether we're going to call it a recession or just a slowdown remains to be seen. But, you know, markets go through these phases. And, you know, right now, this is a market that is is feeling like a recovery trade. It's probably not the recovery trade. It's not the beginning of the next cycle. So you'll probably give back some of this in early 2024 as the uh, as the economy starts to roll over. But what that means is the Fed pivots. And when the Fed pivots, that's when the new cycle emerges. So this is a you know, this is still a, a recovery trade here. We're likely to see, you know, a, a pullback in, in early 2024 with the economy. But as soon as the Fed is, uh, you know, shifts stance, typically over the next couple of years, if not more, you tend to do quite well in markets. So then how do you borrow the rally and not buy it, not buy to own for the long term if you're looking to avoid some of that give back in the beginning of next year? Well, that was part of what I was talking with uh, Jonathan about with the FOMO story. It's, you know, I don't know how tactical investors want to be. I mean, if you, you know, we use we have tactical strategies that will rotate based on where you are in the regime. But if you're looking out even from here 
over the next few years, um, you should be invested in risk assets. If I use 1980-81 as an example, and I think I've said it on this show before, that you got a nice rally once inflation had um, peaked in March of 80. Um, the market did roll over with the with the recession. You never went through the bottom. And again, if you had invested when uh, inflation had peaked in 80 or when the Fed was done tightening at the end of 80, you were very happy in 82, 83, 84, and beyond. So, you know, focus on the, you know, to me, it's focus on what uh, tends to move markets most. Um, end of inflation, end of tightening tends to be very good for risk assets. Brian, first in, first out. The rate hiking <clears throat> cycle in EM started months and months, maybe eight, nine months before the tightening cycle started in DM. We saw the rate cut over in Chile on Friday. I think Brazil is going to follow on Wednesday. Others will follow later this year. We've got an easing posture, I'll call it, coming out of China. Brian, what are the opportunities in emerging markets at the moment? Yeah, I mean, look, you want to lean into where policymakers are providing support uh, to the economy. And this is a very interesting environment. You know, investors didn't love EM for the prior decade because EM struggled to come out of the global financial crisis. To your point, EM leads out more accommodative. And even what you saw in the developed world, what you saw specifically with Japan on Friday, I mean, this is a very different environment where the Fed could be contemplating easing by next year um, and the major developed market central banks are still tightening, which tends to portend a weaker dollar versus our major trading partners, which we haven't seen in a long time. And and that starts to unlock some of that value that exists um, outside the United States. And, you know, investors haven't been there. They've they've avoided it. But it, it's a better backdrop for international investing than we've seen in a while, because, quite frankly, any time international participated in the last cycle, either the U.S. freezed rates or started a trade war or we got a pandemic, which uh, <laughs> ended up abruptly uh, ending any type of participation from international markets. We've been burnt a few times. Brian, it's good to catch up as always and great call for the year so far. Brian Levitt there of Invesco on this equity market. Thank you, sir. The original front loaders, the Fed likes to describe themselves as front loading policy, of front loading all these rate hikes and now they can pause. They weren't the front loaders. The front loaders yeah, were in emerging markets, which is yeah. why we're starting to I see an easing start yes. kick in earlier in places in like Brazil. Chile, Brazil, yeah. and maybe other places too, Tom. I strongly agree with that. And the issue here is the degrees of freedom that they have. And the emerging markets have much less wiggle room, degrees of freedom, than the major banks. So when they have to act, they have to act to protect the different dynamics within their system. Now, can we pour some rocket fuel on that. I don't know. I still don't know how to describe what's happening in China. Lisa, I get the language is shifting. I'm calling it an easing posture. I'm waiting for the follow through, aren't you? Very much so. I, I, I noticed that you said easing posture, and it accurately describes what we got. No details about exactly supporting direct consumers. No details around how they plan to ignite a housing market that really is facing both high leverage, lack of people actually in said homes, and the fact that they've already built up, so they don't really have that stimulus lever. Now people are talking about deflation. I mean, do you buy this? that China's facing sort of Japanese last decade? Well, someone's buying the stimulus chat because Chinese equities last week had the best week of the year, Tom. Yeah. Pretty much across the board, pick an index. It had the best week yeah. of 2023. Yeah, I'm not an expert on this, but I would say that Chinese inflation is an interesting commodity and it's wrapped around pork prices, to be honest. It can be hugely distorted domestically, and that's a different inflation than their international inflation on a goods basis. That looks like there could be disinflation or deflation. Great lineup this morning to get you started <clears throat> for the week. Barry Bannister, Chief Equity Strategist over at Stiefel, is going to be joining us in about 47 minutes' time, pushing ahead to the main events of the week. Big earnings on Thursday after the close with Apple and Amazon. I think those two names alone combined make up about 17% of the Nasdaq it's 100. They are the index. It's just, yeah, basically, Bramo, yeah. those two names make up a massive part. chunk of it. They report on Thursday. On Friday, get used to this, I guess, 200K. 200K, just a ton of estimates that payrolls come in at 200K. An old school number. Yeah, that's still solid. Overall, I think that the inflation outlook is quite positive, that it should be slowly diminishing from here. 
But again, we've just continued to be surprised by the dynamics of this reopening economy. And so we can't prejudge it. We have to let the data actually guide us. Neil Kashkari there, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis president, speaking to CBS over the weekend, who basically called soft landing hopes and dreams somewhat unrealistic. We'll come back to those comments a little bit later. A couple of Fed speakers through the week going into payrolls. Look out for Goresby, look out for Barkin, <coughs> Richmond and Chicago, respectively. And look out for some data a little bit later. Lisa's talked about this a few times over the last week or so. The Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, basically how tight are lending standards getting from banks in America? And that's going to be worth watching for all of us several months, Tom, after the banking malaise in this country. You know, I had a quiet moment on my sabbatical, and I, and I really thought about something you two have brought up, which is I, I just think it's weird how we have 100 percent agreement on the Fed on these votes. There's no dissent. No dissent at all? I don't think it's healthy. I, I think the British do it much better. And, you know, the ECB, I, did they dissent at the ECB? I don't know. But I just think the whole 11 to 0, we all agree. I'll say this. I don't think it lasts. And if you get some pushback, yeah. it comes from the obvious places. It comes from the Fed president's lease. So whether it comes from the board, it hasn't come from the board in a long, long time. The best part of 20 years. The ambiguity, the strategic ambiguity that we hear is covering for a lot of disagreement and theory underneath the Fed. So to your point, maybe September, maybe November, that's where you start to get the fissures as people start to say theory, maybe Trump's data that doesn't yet show some of the tightening. <clears throat> Equities right now just about unchanged on the S&P 500, just to whip through the price action for you. In a bond market, yields climbing just a little bit higher by two or three basis points, 397.87. Talked a lot about the Fed already this morning. We'll talk a little bit more about the ECB. Eurozone GDP data actually showed some growth after stagnating and contracting in the previous couple of quarters. So we'll talk about that. The CPI is still a problem. The euro is stronger by 0.2% against the dollar, Tom. Euro dollar, 110.35. Right now, we will go to the red bars. They're in the New York Times poll today, which is front and center as we stagger into August of 2023. It is in August of a Republican debate. Wendy Schiller joins us now, director of Taubman Center for American Politics Policy at Brown University. She's familiar uh, with the electoral process. Wendy, have you ever seen anything like this? We got a guy with various legal challenges, completely dominating a party, 54% Trump, the governor of Florida, 17 percent, and everybody's barely a heartbeat as, as well. Does Trump own the party? Uh, it looks like he owns the party right now, and he's being treated like the incumbent president. You know, how dare you challenge him? I think, you know, if you're the opposition, the takeaway from this poll is you have to go after Trump directly. I think they've all resisted it, particularly DeSantis. He sort of runs around it, but he's got to go right at Trump. Some of the comments that they solicited in the poll after their sort of standard answers were Trump's right. a fighter, Trump's a fighter. That's exactly what they want to see from the other candidates. Are you willing to do what this guy does? Um, and the other warning sign, I think, for the party as a whole is that there be, seems to be a bunch of Republicans that are willing to throw out the rules. Right. So if Trump loses a few primaries or it's really close and he claims they're rigged, he could undermine the entire Republican Party nomination <laughs> system. Uh, so I think that the comments are really important to look at in this poll. Long ago and far away, Jimmy Carter, the governor of Georgia, walked down the stairs of an airplane in Rochester, New York, and shook Midge Costanza's hand. And we all said, who is this guy? Who's the Jimmy Carter this time around? Of the 2%, the 3%, Pence, Scott, Haley, Ramaswamy, Christie, who's the Jimmy Carter of the moment? Right now, I think it's Tim Scott. I think that Tim Scott has a lot of the qualities that would appeal to the base. Um, if they uh, could get themselves out of a sort of cult of personality of Trump uh, and, you know, out of the sort of avenging his loss in 2020. Uh, I think he has a lot of appeal, particularly among evangelicals or conservative Christian voters in the South and can peel away theoretically some portion of that African-American base, just as George Bush sort of peeled away a, a considerable portion of Latino base, but also a little bit of the African-American base. Uh, and I think that's someone you should pay attention to. I think you, the political observer, should pay attention to. And a Trump Tim Scott ticket would be a very interesting dilemma, I think, for the Democratic Party. You said that it, one of the things that candidates have to do is go straight after the former President Trump. And yet Will Hurd, uh, formerly of Texas representative, came out and actually did that in Iowa. And he was booed off the stage. What makes you think that it will be received by the voters? 
Well, the question is who's going to these rallies and, you know, who's actually going to vote six months from now. And do you set the stage like Chris Christie's trying to do in some ways of saying, I can fight just as hard for what you believe in and I'm willing to take your boots. I mean, I'm willing to take anything you throw at me, but I'm going to stay in the race. <clears throat> and I think that's, you know, if it's possible for them to do in terms of financial contributions. The other problem with this poll for DeSantis is that it will scare donors right, that this guy can't get traction, what do we do? And the Republicans have to be careful about the Senate in 24. The House, this helps, right? Generating Trump fans going out the door for polling is good in gerrymandered districts for the House Republicans. But for the Senate, they lost in 2022, mainly because of Trump-endorsed candidates. The same fate awaits them in 2024. So this is going to send, I think, some shutters through the entire Republican Party. Today, we're going to get some disclosures uh, from the former President Trump's campaign in terms of the Political Action Committee and how some of the money has been spent. The expectation is that millions, tens of millions of dollars have been spent on legal bills for Trump, as well as his associates. Will this be a problem for the donors, or has this been sort of understood that this is sort of the fight that they're trying to get behind as part of the fight that he has lost? launching for president. Lisa, this is a, a, a sort of a, a watching technical question for people who care about campaign rules. Uh, but Trump has made no you know, bones about soliciting money for him, for his campaign, for his legal defense. It is all about him. It is not about the Republican Party. It is about him. So nobody will be surprised. And the donors, particularly the small donors, don't seem to care. They're in it for him. He's their team. They're not defecting from him. The problem is, the, you know, the majority of voters or the people who can win an election for you have defected, particularly independents, but some slice of the Republican Party. And that for the general election is really a tremendous problem, uh, you know, facing the Republican Party going to 24. So, you know, the voters in the Republican Party don't care how Trump spends the money. They're giving it to support him. Can we talk about the voters in the Democratic Party and how they might view the president's handling of his situation with his son at the moment, Wendy? There are plenty of allegations over the last year about his business dealings. What have you heard of, on that recently? Well, I mean, I think Democrats face an enthusiasm gap. We've seen that. Uh, Biden's getting a little bit better. You know, his approval rating going a little bit higher. You know, things are better than people thought they might be, particularly with the economy. Um, and some of the policies that he enacted are starting to show to voters. So he's got a little bit of momentum. He said flat out he wouldn't pardon his own son. Um, this deal that fell apart, the plea deal, I think in, in the end, politically, that's an advantage for Joe Biden. Uh, I think um, people were skeptical of that deal, and it could be a liability for him to, a year from now uh, among Democratic voters who don't get the same deal from prosecutors. So I think in how this plays out for Hunter Biden, if there's any punishment that people view as legitimate, I think that actually helps Joe Biden. Personally, obviously not. But politically, I think it does. Wendy Schiller of Brown University. Wendy, thank you for kicking off our coverage this <laughs> week. In about an hour from now, we'll catch up with Anne-Marie on some of these issues. I said to AMH in the last week, Tom, to follow politics in America right now, you need a law degree. Yeah. You need a law degree to keep a up with some law of this degree stuff. Or civil law degree. Big yeah. time. Yeah, absolutely. What was interesting, that's the first real conversation we've had on the horse race, and that shows you how, you know, in the doldrums of the summer, it's changing. We're going into August, we've got this debate coming up, and all of a sudden we're talking horse race with Professor Schiller. You know, it's a whole new world And closing all. the gap with the, the former the, president, or at least yeah, trying to. I just, I'll say it again. Not much I evidence just, of that at the moment. Can we just do this like the British system where... What, do it quickly, get it done fast? You know, like July of 2024, we And the media the and the broadcasters love to complain about this. They love it. I know. They love it. <laughs> it gives them something. 18 months of runway, Bramo, just keep dragging it out and dragging <clears throat> it out. Look, on a slow summer uh, day, that's why everybody talks about it, right? We've Everyone, got a debate. On. Well, uh, but to your point uh, about some of the challenges to the former president and then also the president, there's a question, OK, well, if Trump doesn't have the enthusiasm, does Biden? And how does he consolidate it, right? Is he such a sure shoe in win? If if he does have some of these I, challenges that really raise questions, not only about the legal system, about, you know, a lot of the investigation bodies as well. Anne-Marie has thoughts, I'm told. She'll be with us in about <laughs> 60 thoughts. minutes. Plenty of thoughts, the Yankees, I'm told. Last the place, Yankees, the Yankees and, probably thoughts on that as well. Did they not get it done over the weekend? They did not get it done. No? Did they rest and Aaron the Red Judge? Sox did not get it done either. No? So. But they're doing better than the Yankees this year. They're right? doing better. They had a okay. wonderful July. Carl Weinberg of High Frequency job. Economics on payrolls this Friday and the latest data out of Japan. Up next. Straight back into it this morning, pushing ahead to earnings on Thursday from Big Tech. 
on Friday, the payrolls report just around the corner. Equity futures on the S&P on the Nasdaq shaping up as follows. Equity futures on the S&P 500 slightly firmer by 0.07%. Building on the gains last week, a third straight week of gains on the S&P, a gain of about 1% over the previous five sessions. The Nasdaq 100, the outperformance snapping back. Big week of gains, up 2%, encouraged by the earnings from Meta and from Alphabet, Google, of course, as well. Next stop, Apple and Amazon on Thursday. In the bond market, your two-year yield up around about four basis points. The smallest weekly move going back to <coughs> late June. Some stability at the front end of the curve. We don't get to say that often in 2023. Yields are higher by a single basis point. Your two-year, 488.70. Your tenure at the moment up by three, 397. 87. We could talk about the BOJ's role in that in just a moment. In the FX market, just to push it through foreign exchange for you, the euro at the moment, 110.38, positive by 0.2%. Just a bit of strength on the euro side of things. And we'll talk about the data from the eurozone in about 60 seconds time. Under surveillance this morning, the Bank of Japan surprising markets once again, announcing an unscheduled bond purchase operation to tamp down rates, with yields spiking to a nine-year high. The bank announced it was buying the equivalent of more than $2 billion in bonds. Confusing because the the move comes only days after the bank tweaked yield curve control. And TK, we're trying to figure out where on earth is that line in the sand? A line in the sand is a percentage change. I put this out on Twitter when I was on my sabbatical. I was on some beach. The Greek islands are just it's nice. incredible. And the answer is, and Stanley Fisher is very good at this, and the answer is you take the first derivative. And so it's a change off of 0.45. So it's 0.05 on the initial move divided by 0.45. The percentage change of the move is shocking. And I don't care what anybody says, that's yield up, price down. Somebody's taken a loss in all this festivities. Well, as someone said on Friday to Lisa and I when we were covering this, one basis point on a Japanese government bond yield is not one basis point in the Treasury market, Lisa. And what we're trying to figure out, I guess, after Friday's move, is this about the speed of the move that brought them back into the market? Or is there a level there that they didn't like? It's a great point. A lot of people are suspecting it probably is the speed of the move. They want it to be controlled. Some people doing the calculations that on a portfolio of JGBs for the U.S. government concerned for the Japanese government, considering that they own them all or a lot of them, not all of them, um, half, that of it would them. Be, <laughs> half of them, it would be a loss of about four and a half percent if they were to move up to that one percent target on the 10 year. <clears throat> so this is the question. Are we heading toward that kind of issue or is this going to be, you know, just 0.6? Is a lot in the sand. Did you see the minutes from the Bank of Japan? I won't tell you I what read them these like I read the from. US minutes. Here's the quote. Here's the quote. <clears throat> we should avoid deploying our firepower in incremental steps and aim to achieve the target at the earliest time possible. This was Governor Kuroda talking about getting inflation back to target. Specifically, I have about two years in mind. The date of that quote, April 2013. Don't be, don't so we be, had the four minutes yeah. from the meeting that took place 10 years ago, and they were talking about a two year time horizon to get back inflation to where they wanted to be over a sustainable period, over a longer time horizon. And, and Lisa, they're still not there in their own mind. And this is 10 years later. It's a problem when you're looking at data from the central bank that's a time capsule, that's not giving you anything in real terms. To your point, if they like to move slowly, certainly some massive move in the yields isn't going to really help anything. But, you know, really the key question is, was this a departure and a shift toward yield curve control abandonment? Or was this really just a slight tweak to give some strategic ambiguity to markets? We'll talk more about this through this morning. That's the latest out of Japan. We have to talk about the latest out of China. More data, more evidence that the economic recovery is losing a bit of steam. This time, the data for July, prompting Beijing to promise small support measures to boost consumption. <coughs> we have the manufacturing PMIs rising slightly but still coming in at 49.3. So that's falling short of that 50 market that separates expansion from, from contraction. And then you've got this as well, the non-manufacturing PMI in the mix, Tom, easing a little bit to 51.5. Bottom line, the data in China is still looking a bit <coughs> sluggish on the latest read. Yeah, the data is sluggish. Just do something. And that's the answer within the fiction that is there. Uh, economics, the issue here is Beijing is going to come to the rescue. In what form will they come to the rescue and and, and, and whatever? The answer is there's deflation in order and do they inflate their way out of it? That's a short answer. And history says they will do it. They will have to act to provide societal stability. Europe would like to see that as well. Their data is problematic, let's put it that way. It's a return to growth, but inflation is still an issue. Second quarter GDP <coughs> advancing by 0.3%. After shrinking and stagnating in the previous two periods, that 
pretty much sums up the backdrop for growth in the eurozone at the moment. And then core CPI, Bramo, for July coming in a touch above estimates of 5.5%. And a team at Bloomberg pointing out that core CPI surpassing headline inflation for the first time since 2021. President Lagarde, Bramo, can't get a break especially given the fact that energy prices have been inflecting upwards. So if you're getting a big boost from the fact that energy prices have come down or been low, that could change at a time where the underlying <coughs> wages and other forces are really pushing things upwards. So at what point does the ECB reverse some of the dovish tone and really lean into rate hikes. Christine Lagarde over the weekend saying that a pause isn't just a pause, that they could we then could go, go again. again and mm. basically doing a J Powell. All, all this is under surveillance. I think it's great economics around the world and, and that. To me, the only thing under surveillance here is Kane has got one foot in Germany this morning. By Munich, the meeting happens today. It, it's, yeah. like, it's like they're, they're arguing about value, right? So Daniel Levy, who runs the club, yeah, I understand TK. There seem to be some pressures. meant to have pressures. a meeting going into the weekend, then the meeting got scheduled, and they meet again today with Bayern Munich, the German football powerhouse. Is that house, the same we'll quality if, if of goes. league? Is, it, is the German league as difficult, as challenging as the Premier League? No, I wouldn't say it is. I would say that the Premier League is the elite of European football right now, given the players and the teams that they've got. But Bayern Munich is incredibly competitive in the Champions League in a way that Harry Kane would like Tottenham to be, but they're not. And that's the issue. And I think if he's going to leave Spurs, TK, you'd think he would go to a club like that instead of a cross-town rival, where he would be hated by Spurs fans for going to, say, a Chelsea, or going up to somewhere like Manchester. Or Liverpool. Or, yeah, or Liverpool or something like that. But we'll see what happens, Tom. It's, it's he's getting older. This is his last big chance of getting a, a yeah. larger contract. Oh, yeah, and, and you look at the European mess of club. Tottenham right now. I mean, you can understand. Probably Adele will, will root for Baron. As well. Right now, on what we've done under surveillance, looking here particularly at the Pacific Rim, Carl Weinberg joins us. He's chief economist at High Frequency Economics, but far more than that, is steeped in financial crisis on an international basis. And his notes on China and Japan have been absolutely definitive. Carl Weinberg, why hasn't the yen moved abruptly off of the verbiage and action of the Bank of Japan? Hi, good morning, Tom. Good morning, John. Good morning, Lisa. You know, the currency isn't going to move on a dime. They only uh, moved on Friday. And, and this change in policy uh, brings, sets off different forces in the economy. It's not just about interest rate differentials. But if you're an investor in Japan and you're looking to deploy marginal funds, you're looking at almost an assured loss on uh, long-term JGBs right now. And if you need to have long-term assets to, off to offset long-term liabilities, you have to look abroad. So uh, to a certain extent, this uh, tightening of monetary conditions or the allowance of bond yields to rise, whatever you want to call it, drives money abroad and makes the yen cheaper, which is not what your traditional interest rate theory says it ought to do in the, in the terms of the currency. But I think we have to expect uh, a really mixed pattern for the yen moving forward from here. Do you, what's your scope and scale on yen move? I mean, I know you're not in the business of FX analysis, but are you looking... 150 yen or 132 yen? Well, uh, I'm not going to take a long-term position on that because I still don't know what the Bank of Japan is up to entirely. I mean, uh, we saw this widening of the band. Was this a technical adjustment just to allow uh, more uh, trading both ways in the bond market and to uh, improve uh, uh, trading conditions for people who have to be in the market? Or was it the first step in an actual tightening of monetary conditions? It's not at all clear. As Lisa pointed out, we did the calculations that show that if we had the stock, if we had the bond market fully adjust to the increase in the band, that the hit to portfolios economy-wide would be about 4.5% of GDP. That was our math. And right now, we have a huge profit on the Nikkei that if we were to call the end of the fiscal year today and all those bond yield all that bond yield headroom were used, we'd see kind of a wash between gains on equities and losses on bonds. That's a one-shot deal, and I think that UEDA-san is hoping to take advantage of that, hoping that the stock market will continue its rally and offset losses on the bond market and give him this little step toward normalization. But if that's it, if it's, if it's half a percentage point and that's it, then there's no impact on the yen whatsoever beyond the next couple of weeks, and there's no basis to look for a major move. We were also talking about China and how much willingness there will be by the People's Bank of China and just in general with, from authorities to support an economy that's flirting with deflation, outright deflation. Do you think that they can come in with something that can avoid more protracted deflation over a sustained period of time? 
Well, good morning, Lisa. You know, China's inflation has been nothing much to talk about for a long time. We've been talking about sub-2% inflation, except in times when pork prices have been stalling. So we're at the low end of a distribution, but we're not nearly in a deflationary range. The signs of deflation are not there in China in particular. The, the monetary aggregates are still growing, although not as fast as they'd like them to grow. And wages are still going up. So uh, we're not. I'm not particularly scared about uh, deflation in China. What concerns me more is that of a deep recession in China that might have impacts on the stability of the regime, on the stability and constancy of economic policy. And uh, that's where I think uh, the big risks are. China, unlike the Western economies, doesn't respond to interest rate cuts, uh, to the normal kinds of consumer spending or depressing policies that we see in uh, the Western world, because most of their growth is driven by investment and not by consumer spending, and most of that investment is planned by the state. The problem with their growth engine is that they've run out of really lucrative investment projects, and that's causing their growth rate to slow down on a secular basis. And that's what they have to try to offset by switching by switching the source of growth from investment to consumption. And that requires a careful mix of policies. Just quickly, Carl, how likely do you think it is that there is some sort of deeper recession within China? Well, I think that a recession is probably not the right word. It would be what we would call a growth recession, where growth doesn't occur fast enough to absorb people who still want to come from the farms into the city and to generate the increases in income that people want to see. I think that's the scenario we're looking at in China, sub Part growth. So we'll see growth this year of maybe one or two or three percent is our forecast, about three percent. But that's way short of what they want, which is in the five to six percent range. And that's a problem for policymakers. Carl, thank you for your insight. It's always valuable. Carl Weinberg there of high frequency economics on China and what's developing at the moment. <clears throat> We're describing this this morning as an easing posture because it's hard to get your hands around actual policy measures. The excitement last week following the Politburo meeting, so this this top body of officials in China, policymaking officials, Lisa, led by Xi Jinping. It was the absence of a line that the Chinese president uses on houses. They're for living, not for speculation. It wasn't included this time around. So there was a feeling from China watchers that maybe they were stepping back from that, that encourage some investment, maybe do some things to help people buy some more homes if they want to. These are the kind of little nuances at the moment. If you're waiting for cold, hard, blunt stimulus to supercharge this economy... I don't know if it's going to happen or not. That's a judgment about the future, but an observation about where we are currently. It's not I, happening yet. I did a panel with BNP Paribas in China 15 years ago, I'll say, and I just had no understanding of how the entire discussion in China is about property. That is the avenue for the masses to try to husband savings and trying to make gain. But this is the reason why they don't want to lean into that lever. Because they have inflated this market so substantially, they're worried about a bubble and they want to create a more even and developed <clears throat> market in their economy that emphasizes the middle class. They can't do that if they continue to inflate housing that isn't occupied in a significant way. I mean, the whole kind of concept of ghost well, cities isn't the, sustainable. Yeah, yeah, a third of the kind. I mean, Jonathan Anderson at UBS did legendary work on this. John, is a generalization, I don't quote me on the number, a third of the company is vacant, a third of the country is vacant. I mean, without exaggeration. Yeah, I don't know where the numbers are right now, but TK, yeah. you're right to describe the problem. It's a real issue. The fact of the matter is, we're at the end of July. I keep going back to this. Just think about where we were eight months ago. Yeah. Before the start of 2023, when we were talking about China being the place where the boom would come from for growth. And it's been that disappointing that we're having a discussion going through Q3, out looking into Q4, about the prospect <coughs> of stimulus out of China. That's where the disappointment has been in 2023. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly positive from New York. Good morning. It's tough to afford guidance when you don't have any idea where things are going. We do think you're going to continue to see improvement on the inflation story, but not significant enough improvement that's going to allow central banks to say mission accomplished. The big issues on the growth side, as we look forward, we think that those excess savings are basically spent. The rate cuts are here. 
They're just not coming from the Fed and the ECB. They're coming from Latin America. We'll talk about that in just a moment. That was Tony Rodriguez, the head of fixed income strategy over at Nuveen. To start a brand new training week and close out the month of July, July 31st, <coughs> your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P. Equities with a lift by 0.08%. It's a quiet start stateside. Let's put it that way. In the bond market, yields a little bit higher by three basis points, 397.87. Payroll's the next big stop on Friday. The median estimate in our survey currently 200,000. Do you remember the days, Tom, when every month it was just 200K? We're back, well, to, uh, we're back to estimates know, of 200K. Let's stop there now and reframe this. It was 150 was sort of the run rate, and then it would be above it, and people would scratch their chins and say, why is it 200? This was pre-pandemic. 225, pre-pandemic. And then there was some modeling about what potential GDP is and that non-farm payrolls, heaven forbid, would be 125, and the bold would say 90 and that. I don't know where those numbers are now. But in this employed America, 200 is a shock is a low number. What if it comes in at 250? I mean, what does the Fed do? I mean, I just, I just don't know. I hope that CPI doesn't start <clears throat> picking up again, Tom, with it. And then we're facing a prospect of them being in no man's land and yeah. hiking interest rates and losing faith in longer variable lags and getting caught yeah. wrong-footed big time. They want to slow this down. It's pretty clear, evident is, by is, the recent communication. Is, is Damien here for emerging markets or the MLB trading deadline? Well, let's start with EM. Okay, Rate let's cuts start with out of EM. Chile, 100 basis points. 100 basis points more than expected. We talk that maybe Brazil follows on Wednesday. These were the original front loaders. Yeah. Got in first and they're going to leave first too. Yeah, no, and Hungary's already been cutting. They were one of the first ones. Now Poland CPI came in a little bit less than expected overnight. You know, now you're starting to see people expect them to cut as well. But, you know, the big story overnight, as we know, is China. And the fact that, you know, she is trying to pull whatever lever he can to fuel growth. And without addressing the demand side of the equation, I mean, all right. of these measures just really aren't having an impact, even though you see equities up 10% <clears throat> over the last week on very light volumes. Foreign funds are buying five days in a row. Right. All the good news. But it's the summer, so you really... I, I, get away from this Damien Cesar minutia. To our listeners and viewers, should they be studying and should they consider being in EM and international equities and bonds, just as a general statement? Well, right, right now. now, seeing as emerging market local debt is up something on the order of 11 to 12 percent year to date, mm -hmm. probably waiting for better entry levels at this point. But look, there's still some juice left in the fact that a lot of countries have not announced their easing cycle yet. So that's typically a good time to go into these economies to start receiving and fixed income. But once they start to move, that's typically a bad time. That's typically where you don't want to be moving in. And we're right. starting to see that, as John rightly points out. Within EM, which country should we be studying the closest? You mentioned China earlier, but is there, a, is there a unique opportunity that we need to read in on and get smarter on? I think it's the Asian high yielders. I think it's Indonesia and India right now because, you know, look, they, um, they did hike rates, but there's really no sign that growth is coming off there. So they're really not going to be easing as quickly as some of these others in Latin America and Eastern Europe, I think. And look, let's be, real, let's, let's be clear here. All of the export growth we're seeing or whatever exports we're seeing out of China are not going to the Europe, Europe and the U.S. anymore. They're going to Southeast Asia, right? So let's see how healthy the Philippines and Malaysia and some of these other countries are and how they're weathering the storm. How much is this going to be a rate cutting and interest rate just general uh, story in emerging markets and how much is this going to shift to a commodity story? As you see oil prices post their biggest monthly yeah. gain going back more than a year and you see this pretty much across the commodity complex. You know, it's a, such a good question. I mean, look, oil, I mean, it's anyone's guess as to where it's going next, but interest rate differentials are real. And if you look at performance year to date across the whole of not just <clears throat> emerging markets, but G10 currencies, it's all about carry and the reach for carry. And right now, if you look at a place like China, it's negative carry relative to the U.S. So it disincentivizes not only foreigners from investing in China, it also disincentivizes Chinese corporates who have a lot of dollars parked offshore from bringing it back onshore. And I think that's a big risk as well. Let me just add to that, the yen funded carry trade has funded pretty much a lot of the, um, the, the price returns, the gains we're seeing on paper out of emerging markets. If that rug gets pulled out from under our feet, it's anyone's guess as to what we're sort of, you know, kind of negative feedback loop we're going to see into some of those currencies. There's a lot to unpack there, including what the Bank of Japan is actually doing, which is a big question mark. But just sort of doubling down on this interest rate story, you're saying when they start cutting, that's often a sign that it's over. It's counterintuitive because yeah. usually people say that in the developed world, when they start cutting, it's time to pile in, not necessarily on the currency side, but on the debt side. Why is it so different? in the developing world? Well, it's historical precedent, right? I mean, it's getting out in front of the news, and then when the news actually hits, it's typically time to sell, at least historically, 
that's been the case. This is a very new environment we're in. It's a different cycle, Lisa. So you're right. There may be quite a bit of juice left. I mean, we're talking about rates in Brazil that are 13.75%. So there's a lot of room to cut rates back down to levels we saw during you know COVID. So yeah, you're right. There could be a lot of uh, carry gains, a lot of that. But certainly, I'm, I mean, look, we've got a lot of duration supply coming into the U.S. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of supply come in, but it's been bills to see duration come in, let's see if that will cause the crowding out effect that all of these prognosticators have been waiting for. And and look, I mean, I, I think, you know, you just don't want to, you know, you just don't want to sell short the fact that U.S. liquidity is so critical to the, you know, to, to, the, to the broader emerging market and G10 complex. EM is fascinating right now. The prospect of easing out of China, rate cuts in Chile, maybe Brazil, Argentina easing in Miami, stimulus down there. Do you want to talk about that? The messy effect he won't in play, Florida? He won't play on grass. I mean, he won't play on turf, huh? That's going to be a big deal for, I mean, some of these matches that are... So you've got to describe that for people outside the United States. Right. There are still grounds in this country, in MLS, that have artificial turf. Correct. And and it's bad for the knees, bad for the legs. I mean, Messi's career is on, is on the line if he believes he's so playing So he's on not going to play on artificial turf. So there are, like, Atlanta FC, right? They have, they have the Falcons playing there. They have the... I, I mean, I don't know, but I was reading some article that basically said they can't get the MLS turf up and the grass down quick enough because MLS is like the bastard stepchild of sports. And so I guess at the end of the day, he's not going to play. And the, and the, I'm, I don't know if I can. Am I going to get in trouble? Well, you did. Yeah. But I apologize sorry. for it later. So sorry. Uh, but, but, but you know what I'm saying. Ticket sales, I mean, are still up right. huge across the board. But now he may not actually be playing. I mean, come on. You, you follow this carefully. We make jokes about it. But Damien's a real student of this as well. What have you learned by what Mr. Cohen has spent on the Mets? We've seen this before. But I would suggest we've never seen the scale of I want to buy it now. What have you learned about the Mets' disappointment this year? It's very hard to predict. And pitching is everything. And it's very hard to get. Pitching is everything. Pitching is everything. It's hard to get good starting pitcher. It's certainly hard to get. I mean, look at the Yankees. I mean, their bullpen is in utter disarray. So I think, you know, if you're looking at Major League Baseball and you're looking at Stevie Cohen, he's trying to do all the right things, but you can't buy your way into a championship. You have to develop your farm system. You have to kind of, you know, stick George Michael, you know, go from the ground He's finding out the hard way. Yeah. over in the UK when it comes to the Premier League. Try to do that with Chelsea. Mm. Uh, it's mm. difficult. It's difficult. Even if you've given a blank cheque and you can go out there and buy players, Tom, you can't make it happen overnight. Tell us Never about the baseball. French, the French football, in football player. Kidding Mbappe. <laughs> I loved uh, him in the World it's, Cup. It's, it's going like to be fascinating to see. He is one of the top strikers alongside, I would say, Erling Haaland in world football at the moment. There's only a handful worth a significant amount of money, but PSG face the very real risk that they lose him for nothing next summer when the contract's up. Clearly, Damien, they don't want that to happen. There is a suspicion that he's already got a pre-contract agreement with, say, Real Madrid. But it's not the El Halal $333 million. It's, it's going to be maybe a little bit less than that. Do you think that's going to change sports the in, in a massive way? I think it if already is. If you're a player right now, and you can earn that kind of money. How can you say no? How can you say no? I mean, how well, Mbappe can you say no? reportedly did say no to that much money. Reportedly, reportedly. did say no. To, but you've, you get the feeling now this is just going to completely upend the cost structure of Premier League football clubs in a, in a monster way. And you think about what other sports out there are subject to that same sort of disruption from, yeah, I mean, I think of college sports here in the U.S. with NIL and everything that's going on. Who's to stop some deep-pocketed investor from offshore coming and getting behind a university and buying up all these, you wow. know, sophomores and juniors and redshirt freshmen? Yeah, and would they even get any money? Because yeah, they don't I, even get paid, right? right. Not well, now they do. But NIL, NIL, now they do. Now they do. So I think, you know, college sports is one. I mean, Major League Baseball is another. I mean, Look, so for all intents and purposes, let's get if you want to pay the luxury tax, you can just buy players. Out of all the sports right now, who do you think is most vulnerable to that? We've talked a lot about golf. We've talked about the Premier League. Well, golf obviously is now. I mean, look, I think Major League Baseball is a little bit open to it. College sports is, is another one that really kind of hits me. Not the NFL. They have the cap. Um, you know, uh, certainly not basketball. They have sort of, you know, a cap there as well. Tennis. You just buy the top 20. That's an interesting one. I hadn't really thought of that. Yeah. Why yeah. not? Why not, right? Play six times a year. Yeah. Instead of being on the tour, which could be pretty grueling, you're going all over the place. Are you their agent? What is this? <laughs> are you, are you, <laughs> you're making a I think there's certain tennis players that are going that direction. Exactly. <laughs> Am I doing that one? We should have Damien come in all through August. I mean, it's great entertainment. <laughs> you, know, talk we have, you know, I, can I talk about another property on Bloomberg no, Business of Sports? We, you know. oh, no, we've run out of time. Oh, we've run out of time. <laughs> Sorry. But watch it. I watch promise it, you a little bit it. of time later. Watch it. Whatever it is. <laughs> Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence. Live from New York, your equity market slightly positive on the S&P 500. Coming up next, Barry Bannister of Steve Fulk. This is Bloomberg.
we need to get inflation back to target first, and I think that is the risk. The Fed is at this tenuous point. They need to make sure inflation doesn't reignite. We're at the end of the rate hiking cycle in the West. It really is once that economic data has deteriorated and you're in a cut cycle that you start to worry about those big downsides. If the economy stays strong, you know, there is the risk that the Fed might have to hike more and do more work to, to get the slowing that they need. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The Bank of Japan doing its best to disrupt what was otherwise <clears throat> a nice, quiet yeah. summer Monday. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Your equity market on the S&P 500, just a little touch firmer, slightly positive on the S&P by 0.1%. Talked a lot already this morning about the earnings from big tech coming on Thursday, Apple, Amazon on Friday, the payrolls report. Tom, need to look back just a touch on what's happened with Japan. A tweet to yield curve control on Friday. We wanted to work out what the line of the sand would be. Is it 0.6%, 0.7, 0.8? Would they let it go all the way to 1% on a Japanese 10-year government? And bond yield and Tom, they're already back in the market today. Yeah, the Bank of Japan makes a day two. And again, all I can do is watch the litmus paper, which is 142.26 yen, a weaker yen here. Uh, we had some good conversation at this morning. I thought Carl Weinberg was quite uh, good as well. But I would go back to earnings as economic data. Microsoft is, you know, to look back a week. February, OMG, we're all going to die. Late April, OMG, we're all going to die. End of July, Microsoft, it's terrible. We're going to die. And they had a nice bounce the least last part of the week. Are Apple and Amazon an economic proxy within the stock market for America? The two names that are up something like 50% so far year to date, they have this in common, Tom. They've surprised to the upside so far in 2023. And this economy, in many ways, Lisa, has surprised to the upside. So here is the tension point. Is this a soft landing? Is this a natural disinflation? Or is this that there are signs of weakness that haven't yet that come through in some of the earnings, or could you see a reacceleration in inflation? Those are the three outcomes that people are looking at, and no one can consolidate around one particular view. Well, the consensus view right now, and I think we can call it consensus, just hopes and dreams of soft landing and soft landing data through the rest of this summer, Tom. That's the hope, the dream of the equity market bull currently. I, I, I'm looking at the GDP numbers. I was on sabbatical here, and you know, I, I, I glanced at them, and I don't think I'm out at 3% GDP. But let's remind ourselves, 2.5% real GDP is a solid number. I wonder if we're going to have a solid August, a solid September. I put out on Twitter this week in the success of Renaissance uh, Capital and Neil Dutta in defining what solid is over the last 18 the months. The optimism, 2% real, is a <clears throat> million miles better than recession, which is where a lot of people thought we might be come the end of summer, Lisa. I wonder how much people are sort of suggesting at this soft landing, but their conviction is in momentum. Because on the margins, people are quite concerned that you either get inflation reaccelerating or you get a more material slowdown. So from an investing standpoint, a lot of people are saying it doesn't matter. For right now, as Brian Levitt said, make hay while the sun still Sweet shines. Spot. Let's go. And it might not last, but right now it's too early to say exactly which direction the it's going to go. The city's a great example of that on the economic side of things. Andrew Hollenhorst thinking inflation reaccelerates. On equity trading, you've got the likes of Stuart Kaiser, who says we're in a <coughs> sweet spot. You can see further upside, Tom, through the summer. Year to date, it's just not Apple. Year to date, SPX up 19%, NASDAQ composite up 37%, Dow trailing up 7% as well. These are good numbers. I mean, I, I across the, the board. broadening that's happening, and I didn't see that much rationalization this week, and I guess everybody was off. But well, give them a chance to write that Mike notes, Wilson Tom. wrote, but you still, know, there's you know. 703. <laughs> still young. Wall Street it's true. time on, no, fair, on a fair, Monday morning. Fair. It is. Where are your notes this morning? Equity futures on the SP, just about positive by 0.1%. There's a lift in this equity market. Yields with a little bit of a lift as well. Up, Lisa, by two basis points. Your 10-year, 397. Today, we are going to be focusing on the earnings to come, but also very much the Fed's senior loan officer opinion survey at 2 p.m. We have seen a gradual tightening in standards. How much do we see that continue, especially given that the Fed was saying that this has shown a tightening in credit conditions? To what degree will it matter again to markets? This week's labor data includes JOLTS data on Tuesday, ADP on Wednesday. I love this. Nobody cares about ADP until it comes out out and everybody loves it. Productivity on Thursday. Friday is the jobs report. Unemployment has flatlined. At what point do people start to say this is not sustainable in order to get inflation lower? Even uh, even Neil Kashkari, and you pointed to this, uh, John, earlier, <coughs> Neil Kashkari, in an interview with Face the Nation, said 
it seems unrealistic that we are going to get inflation lower without some sort of tick up in unemployment. And for earnings, yes, it's Amazon and Apple on Thursday. And yes, they basically are the index. But there are 169 companies generally of the S&P 500 reporting. So how much are these going to remain the main stories after delivering more than 50% gains so far this year? Unreal. And close to 60% gains <laughs> yes. on Amazon. Just absolutely Unreal. Joining us now to talk about this is Barry Bannister, Chief Equity Strategist at Stiefel. If you haven't been lucky enough to follow Barry's advice through the year 2023, it sounded a little something like this. Constructive for the year ahead, a price target of 4400 on the S&P. And then Barry, more recently, and welcome to the show, by the way, you and I have talked about this already. You're looking for that flat line from here. So Barry, constructive through much of the year, and then just as a lot of people start to get on board and start calling for a sweet spot in the summer, you're calling it a flat line from here. Barry, just explain why. Hey, Jonathan, good to see you again. Um, yeah, a classic recession was never in the cards in the first half. Um, you know, when you helicopter drop 25% of fiscal and monetary into an economy, uh, you're not going to have a recession. Uh, it's the largest policy experiment in 80 to 90 years since the New Deal and World War II. So that was a fairly easy call. I think going forward, the two things that we're watching most closely on the economic front are productivity and oil, because productivity is going to drive your unit labor costs and your core PCE inflation. And oil, you know, I think it, we're still wrapped up <clears throat> in geopolitics. I mm -hmm. think oil is a big risk in the next 12 months, and I, I don't hear many people talking about it. Uh, Barry, what I find interesting here, and I go to Mario Gabelli on this with Mario's work in autos a million years ago in media, you own capital goods. You own, as Gartman would say, things that fall on your foot and hurt you. Tell me about ball bearings. Tell me about Eaton. Tell me about Roper, the world of Bannister from years ago. I know it's underpriced. When does it pop? When I look at uh, various economic indicators, and we've always been big fans of like the PMI manufacturing from the Institute of Supply Management, I would take the over, not the under, on the next three points. Uh, and that's good for the industrials, which I covered, as you mentioned, for about 20, 25 years. Um, the financials also fit into the value category and basic materials. I would throw in energy, though, energy and energy services. They're really uh, dirt cheap on cash flow. They're indispensable uh, for as far as the eye can see. And so when you look at that cyclical value in total, it should outperform cyclical growth, which is your big tech, uh, because I do think the market's a few points overvalued. Yeah. Uh, and it's because of the P.E. ratio, uh, unrealistic expectations regarding financial conditions index that really don't justify the price to earnings ratio that we have right now. If I've missed the Bannister bull market, how do I begin to invest now? Do you dollar cost average blended index or do you go more specific sector? Well, we did, as I just mentioned, the sectors, and there are sector ETFs for all of those, as well as sub-industry, uh, level two industry uh, ETFs at BlackRock. They do a great job with that. Uh, I would also say that you go long, equal-weighted, short-cap-weighted S&P in the second half. Uh, that's uh, RSP long, SPY short. Uh, I like the diamonds over the Qs, so the Dow over the NASDAQ 100 in the second half, and I would buy some protective puts. Uh, for late third, early fourth quarter, around September, October, because I think there'll be some turbulence uh, as the unemployment rate ticks up towards the Fed's 4.1 percent year-end goal. We get <clears throat> perilously close to that trigger point, a sort of a modified SOM rule of a 33 basis point increase in the three-month moving average of the U3 unemployment rate. And that would signal a recession could be on the horizon, and they're usually surprises. What about the people who say, you know what? All of this macro call stuff just hasn't been working. And don't fight the consensus, as Peter Shear said. Uh, don't fight consensus in December and August. Brian Levitt saying, make hay while the sun still shines. Why not just go with momentum, given that in an August, not a lot's going to push against that, including even the data? Well, if you do, uh, 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 we, you can use a forward PE, a trailing PE, and we're particularly fond of using a CAPE PE, a PE on trailing 10-year inflation-adjusted operating earnings in our calculations, and overlaying it against the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, which is an excellent, well-constructed FCI. Uh, if you do that, 
and you do it for the Powell era since 2017, you'll see that the market's about two turns or two multiples overvalued. Uh, so we have some downside here on that momentum trade that you reference. Uh, what we're doing is more tactical trading in the back half after participating in that macro trade, which worked out quite well in the first half. Barry, wonderful call so far this year. It's great to catch up once again. Barry Bannister there of Stiefel on this equity market, looking out for some more difficulty in the back half of 2023. Certainly anything but for the likes of Barry Bannister, who called this market correctly, looking for a rally, and that's precisely what we get. But calling this market and this economy has been so, so difficult. Lisa was tweeting up a storm over the weekend about housing. I noticed that. I was reading the same thing over the weekend in my reading, Lisa, and I came up with this stat from, from Redfin. More than nine of every 10 US homeowners with mortgages, so that's 46.1 million, more than nine out of 10, have a mortgage rate below 6%. <clears throat> yeah. And the proportion of people with something like three to four is pretty spectacular as well, which is why so many yeah. people aren't moving, why Lisa inventory is constrained. And this is the reason why prices can remain high, even though interest rates supposedly are high, but so few people are paying them. So you extrapolate this out into the corporate world. And Lori Calvacino of RBC this morning put out a series of decks showing that companies are also mostly paying very low rates tied to uh, the low rate kind of world. So how interest rate sensitive is this economy that we're looking at right now? Well, the debt reissue is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting with Apple as well to see, and they won't do it in the same day they usually spread it over to announcements but the, the, they reaffirm share buyback by doing another mega bond deal which is what they do and again that's within a higher interest rate environment john stolfus just reports and he has a classic peter lynch uh, insight here john this is stolfus at opco know what you own boy you know, know what you own in october of last year was easy everybody you know doom and gloom up we go that was easy money right here right now you know what you own. Doom and gloom was the easy money. Listen to Bramwoods. <laughs> yeah, the first leg of you a bull market last is year easy. easy. No, but if you if you believe in the <laughs> maximum doom and gloom, if you believe, look, here's the rumor. If you believe in maximum Bramo, right. that's when you go long. <laughs> so Bramo's job that's is easy. That's easy money. Okay. Now it's so a second leg in, <laughs> you know, Stolfus 101. I'm know really excited for the next commercial break. This is going to be great. <laughs> If you're just joining the program, we'll do big little on that. Welcome to the program. The S&P 500 positive here <coughs> by 0.1 percent. Coming up in about 45 minutes, we'll catch up with Michael Purvis of Tallback and Capital Good. Advisors on this equity market. And we have talked a little bit about the lack of pass through to savers from those interest rates. Never mind the borrowers who aren't paying it but just yet. In the UK, the regulator getting very, very frustrated with British banks not passing this on yeah. to savers and. They may well be gearing up to force them to. I'm not sure how they will, but the latest on that a little bit later in the program. My chart of the weekend, not that I was, I was on sabbatical, so I really wasn't looking, but money market fund assets. The public is voting, and they're voting for higher yield. They're moving. I mean, it's convex up. No end for buts about it. They're going to force them to pass the savings. There is on. talk. There are not so subtle threats. Okay. I'm sorry, what is this? So first tell people, okay, no wage increase for you, but we'll make oh. the banks pay you money. I mean, honestly, but are they trying to... This is the regulator. Okay. But do they have money market different. funds in England? Mm. Hmm? Do they have money market funds in England? They have fixed-term deposits. They have things like that. I'm sure there are money market funds. I don't know. Sure. I don't know. Mm. I, I mean, here, it's huge. I mean, the yields... And they're well, beginning to model 6%. There aren't, there, aren't, there aren't 5 trillion... Five trillion. Five and a half trillion. Something like that. Yeah, now, right? it's huge. Yeah. Ginormous. And one idea that's being thrown around is how stimulative is it that people are getting money off their money again? How stimulative well, this is actually a does this that is end the up arch being change. at a time when they're not really paying the higher <clears throat> interest rates? Sonia Miskin coming up soon of BMY Mellon Investment Management. Looking forward to that conversation. That conversation about 15 minutes away. Your equity market positive by 0.1% on the S&P from New York. This is Bloomberg. The economy continues to surprise how resilient it is. We don't want to declare victory. We're making good progress and we're staying on it. If we need to hike, uh, raise rates further from here, we will do so. But we're going to let the data guide us and not prejudge the outcome. Right now, we know shocks can hit us. But right now, the base case scenario seems to be that we'll have a slowing economy, but that we would avoid a recession. And I hope that that's true. 
Hope is not a strategy. Ultimately, Neil Kashgari, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis president, speaking on CBS, by the way, over the weekend, believes that that hope is somewhat unrealistic. That line, though, that we've heard a million times, if we need to hike, we will do so. But we're going to let the data guide us and not prejudge the outcome. It's basically copy and paste from the Fed to the ECB and Lisa, pretty much to every <coughs> Fed speaker we're going to hear this week, I imagine. Which leaves us in a question of which data matters and what happens if the data doesn't show what they need to know before it's time for them to make a move. It doesn't really leave us with any more clarity. No, no, <laughs> but they want to provide less clarity to maximize what they're calling optionality, yep. right? Isn't that the approach? But a lot of people are saying that data isn't going to show the slowdown or the reacceleration in inflation, whichever side of the debate you're on, until it's too late for the Fed to really respond to it. So by de facto, are they just basically saying, we're not going to make a call and we're going to be late one way or another? It showed a slowdown. They hiked interest rates exactly. anyway. So Tom, figure that one out for us, please. I, I, I just think it, it, it's a mess and it's going to be the economic data coming out. And what people want to focus on in the doldrums of the summer is this is an exceptionally busy, busy week. And I, there's just all there is to it. We're a lot smarter at 9 a.m. on Friday than we are right now. 8.31, hopefully, when payrolls comes out on yeah. Friday morning. Your equity market on the S&P? Firmer by 0.1% on the S&P 500. Yields just a little bit higher by a couple of basis points, 396.88. What was that stat on the oil market? Biggest monthly gain, potentially, Lisa, since early last year. Yeah, exactly, in more than a year. And we're looking at potentially adding to those gains <clears throat> as people talk about the tightest oil market going back years, even though we haven't seen that pop. TK Crude, 81. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Brent crude as well, the world price getting rounded up $86 a barrel. I think that's a quiet story, John. Here for July, oil's just sort of crept up. Under the radar, bit. right? Not breaking up, but it's yeah, it's under the radar as well. Right now, we're going to go under the radar with Emery Horton, our Bloomberg summer presidential correspondent. And whether it's FDR up to Hyde Park or uh, various presidents in Martha's Vineyard with A-listers, there's something about a president going away. For President Biden... I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Anne-Marie. It's Rehoboth Beach in Delaware. He has a Delaware State Fair to look at. He has his bicycling on the boardwalk to look at. Describe <laughs> where he is and the mood at the Summer White House. Well, let's hope he's also safe on his bicycle because we have seen him fall off that bicycle when he is in Rehoboth. Uh, that's where he'll remain for the, the week. And then next week, he's really kicking up in terms of looking forward to 2024 as a campaign candidate. But as because pre as president, he'll be going to some states like Arizona and like Utah. So this is just a bit of a summer lull. Um, but... That's just in regards to uh, his public schedule. I don't think it's a summer lull in terms of what is going on behind the scenes with his family. We yeah. do have a very close associate, a very good friend of his son, Hunter Biden, Devin Archer. He'll be behind closed doors today with the House Oversight Committee. We shouldn't say Congress is shut, but uh, there is uh, this hearing that is happening, and a lot of eyes, especially in the, from the Republican Party, will be looking at this in terms of what this individual potentially can say about Hunter Biden's business dealings, whether it was with China or Ukraine, <clears throat> and potentially what the Republicans want to show is that there is some sort of smoking gun that would link this to the current right. president. Joe and we, you know, we try to do economics, finance, investment, and all of that. A balanced approach here is the mandate from our founder, Matt Winkler. Along with the, for our international audience, the cable news cycle in America is polarized by the travails of the president's son. How focused is the president on this day to day? Is your reporting, your perception, all the context you have, is this a president riveted by the travails of his son or is it something being handled from a distance? Well, I think like any human being, something happening to your child, right, is going to weigh on you. But obviously, I think the president probably tries to, and this is me just projecting, I don't really know how he feels about this issue. I know he does not like to speak about his family, especially Hunter Biden in this way in public. Um, we did over the weekend, did get to get a statement the first time ever the president has acknowledged his seventh grandchild, which is um, Hunter's child living in Arkansas. Uh, but the president doesn't really like to talk about Hunter publicly. Um, he probably likes to 
put things in boxes, right? Family and presidency. But I imagine as a parent, this weighs on the president yeah. and the first lady as well. And Ray, there's a larger issue here, especially given the former President Trump's legal issues. And some people saying, even if he could win the Republican nomination, he's not going to win the general election. Likewise, there's a question around Joe Biden and the enthusiasm that he can bring. And if he is paired up with Donald Trump, is he definitely going to win? Or are there signs pushing against that, given the fact <clears throat> that there are some real issues or concerns about his age and uh, a lot of unresolved questions around how his tenure would go? So two things. First, I think, and many Americans think both these individuals are just too old. And you're seeing that really start to come out now, given what we saw last week, whether it was Senator Mitch McConnell, whether it was Senator Dianne Feinstein. There is a growing call. Nikki Haley talked about it yet again over the weekend at the Iowa dinner. There's a growing call of of a new generation of leaders. Um, but yes, those concerns certainly weigh on Biden at the moment because he is the acting president of the United States. It's not a for sure conclusion that if it was going to be a rematch of 2020, Biden versus Trump, that Biden would win. I don't think anyone could today project who is going to win the November 2024 race. The polls show that Biden would have this lead on Trump, but I think it's just too far out. Remember, at this time in 2015, Yes, Trump is an incumbent now, but at this time in 2015, the top two candidates in the GOP horse race was Jeb Bush and, um, and the former governor of Wisconsin, yeah. Scott Walker. Trump was at 1%. Chris Christie, another current challenger of his now, was at 6%. So it's just too early on. We haven't even had our first presidential debate um, to speculate. But obviously, what you see within the Republican Party at the moment is this massive lead Trump has. And I think the latest New York Times Siena poll, their first of this race, really shows that. And there's one line that stood out to me in that poll about when individuals are asked about Trump and DeSantis, who are the top two candidates, but Trump clearly is just crushing DeSantis in this poll. And they say people like Mr. DeSantis, but people love Mr. Trump. You talked about Nikki Haley proposing a competency test for everyone who is an elected official over the weekend. And you heard Asa Hutchinson's response, which is, that sounds nice, but it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't pass muster constitutionally. And Maria, have people looked at doing something like a competency test and found that legally it would not fly? I think there's been lots of talk about this, especially given this polls well with Americans. Most Americans want to see upper age limits, but the fact is they also say that if there's a candidate that is very wise, even if they're older, but can do the job and is fit to do the job, they should be able to. It'll be hard one to get through Congress, but at the moment it is being used as a very big talking point given the backdrop of what has happened in Washington and the fact that you are seeing scare, scary moments and worrying moments of elected officials struggling um, right in front of the public, right in front of the camera. So that is why this has been a major discussion. Whether or not it leads to legislation, that remains to be seen. Hey, Mace, let's squeeze this in. <clears throat> Last week, there was a victory lap for Labour off the back of a deal between UPS and Teamsters. Yesterday, Yellow, we're talking about one of the oldest and biggest US trucking businesses going out of business. Have we had a response from the White House yet on that? Ha have not seen a response yet in the White House, Jonathan, but obviously uh, the press secretary will be briefing today, and I imagine uh, that will be one of the top questions to her alongside everything else that's going on uh, with the Biden administration and his family. 30,000 jobs, I believe, TK. Yeah, it's huge. There, potentially, it's a big deal. Amory, thank you. Down in Washington, 22,000 of those Teamsters members. Lisa. And Teamsters had been negotiating with them and couldn't come to a resolution. They said that, that they wouldn't even come to the table, which was a key question at a time when Yellow said that they offered them raises <sighs> that they didn't even negotiate on. So really some questions here. Like you, I'm always looking for some kind of macro signal. The more I read about the company, the more I believe that, that it's just a, a yellow yes, John, problem, agree. Tom. All the right? debt. I have to be careful. Maybe not a signal about the broader economy. Yes right now. Equity futures on the S&P 500, slightly positive by 0.1%. Sonia Meskin of BNY Mellon Investment Management coming up next.
third week of gains on the S&P 500 last week, looking to add to them this week with earnings on Thursday from Apple and Amazon. And then payrolls to set the tone at the back end of the week. Futures right now positive by 0.1%. On the Nasdaq up by 0.08%. Talked a lot about the weightings on the Nasdaq. <coughs> the monster big tech names. Amazon, Apple, almost 17% of the Nasdaq 100, is really? which you, is just That's nuts. amazing. I did not know that. Isn't that incredible? Two stocks. It's ridiculous. Let's turn to the bond market. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year shaping up as follows. Muted gains in a two-year yield Muted. last week by close to four basis points. On a two-year this morning, <coughs> it changed at 487. 66, data dependent, a lack of clarity, including from Neil Kashkari over the weekend in an interview with CBS, who basically said, we might hike. We might not. Is he a hawk or a dove this week? He's whatever he wants to be, Tom. Yeah, we might exactly. hike, we might not. It's totally data dependent. Let's see what the data brings through the rest of summer going into the September Federal Reserve meeting. For the ECB, wow, what a difficulty for them in the FX market. The euro this morning, slightly stronger, 110.32, after the biggest weekly decline, I think, on a single currency against the dollar going back to May. The data, so GDP, here's the good news. Lisa, a bit of growth. Here's the bad news. It comes with inflation, core CPI, above headline CPI for the first time, I believe, since 2021. This is a big concern at a time when energy kind of saved <clears throat> Europe in a lot of ways. People thought that that helped fuel some of the GDP gains. And now we're looking at potentially a slowdown in China, and we're looking at energy prices going up at a time when core inflation, driven by wages and all of the other kind of services-driven sectors, are accelerating. How do you put that together? Oh, with difficulty. Let's put it that way. Under surveillance this morning, plenty of difficulty to follow the BOJ. The Bank of Japan surprising markets again, announcing an unscheduled bond purchase operation to try and do something about the drift tire and yields we've seen over the previous 24 hours. Yields spike into nine-year <clears throat> highs. The bank announced it was buying the equivalent of more than two billion dollars of bonds. Tom, it comes only days after the bank tweaked yield curve control. Right. So it's did it move too quick or did it breach a certain level? And your great introduction there, John, it was all yield analysis. They refuse to talk about price because they don't want to talk about price. And the answer is yield up, price down. Somebody within the complex system, as Carl Weinberg brilliantly mentioned an hour ago, has to take a loss within these closed systems, this domestic system of the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance, somebody somewhere has to take a loss. That's the great unspoken right now. The buy side itching to short some of that <clears> stuff. <throat> the spillover, still unclear. You'd have to imagine, Lisa, you get to a point at some point somewhere where yields start to shift so high, the domestic investors start to bring the money home. So everyone's <coughs> looking for those vulnerabilities in places like maybe France, across Europe, and including, for that matter, Treasury markets to some extent. And that's the reason why I personally was kind of surprised there wasn't a bigger reaction to an adjustment of the Bank Japan's yield curve control. But it's exactly because of them stepping in at 0.6% to buy bonds that people are not reacting more. We just don't know the extent of what they're doing and how far they're willing to let things kind of normalize. You and I were talking about growth out of Europe allow me to bring you the numbers. So a return to growth, second quarter GDP, GDP advancing 0.3%. This after shrinking and stagnating in the previous two quarters. It's just not great right now for the ECB because that growth profile, Bramo, comes with core CPI of 5.5%. You'd imagine they've got more work to do. They don't want to commit to it. We've talked about the lack of clarity from the Federal Reserve. Take a listen to this from the ECB. This quote is from Lagarde, but it could be from Powell or Kashgari or anyone. A pause whenever it occurs in September or later would not necessarily be definitive. Right. Basically trying to make it a hawkish pause, right, because we might have to go again. The <clears> issue <throat> is, and, and you said this earlier, John, and I think it's an important point, that now we're not hearing the dissent as strongly. Later in the year, it gets a lot tougher when you have to start to interpret the data and give some sort of forward guidance, especially if this trend of subpar growth and sticky inflation persists. Next to war, we're going to revisit eurosclerosis. And what's interesting about this is where's their Amazon? Where's their Apple? They don't exist. That's, we have LVMH. Yeah, yeah, LVMH. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think <laughs> exactly. the, 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 we are seeing the lack of innovation, the dearth of innovation, and this within wonderful French productivity, we're seeing a dearth of innovation. There's no Google, there's no Apple, there's no, you know, blah, we all know the story. Yeah. The Economist or Bloomberg writes it up beautifully, but to me that's the heart of the matter. That's what's held back the equity market 
for so long time. Uh, not only the equity market, but just the spirit of the place, the nominal GDP, the pop of the place. I went to Italy and it felt like they were doing okay. You were in Italy? Yeah, it I felt, didn't like, know it felt that. like they were doing okay. Uh, if, if, that way. if three islands off the shores of Italy is big in Italy. It felt like they were doing okay. Let yeah. me turn to this story. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. The UK's Financial Conduct Authority is warning of what they call robust action for banks that don't transfer benefits <clears throat> of higher rates to consumers. Nine of Britain's biggest lenders, this includes HSBC, Barclays, NatWest, have only passed through about a quarter of interest rate rises to savers. This is from the FCA. So they've been looking back at the rate hikes, all 150 basis points from January out to May. The pass through has been something like 51% to so-called fixed term deposits. Instant access savings. So this is where the bulk of savings are. You go in, plant your money, take it back whenever you want. The pass through has been 28%. That's where the problem is. <clears throat> has it even been that, though, in the U.S.? I don't think it has been even close to that, because if you have your money in a deposit account, you're probably getting zero still in the United States. I'm getting very little. I know, exactly. Market I fund. mean, this is a personal can't, group of mine. Wait, but so. can't British people go to a money market I mean, They're on money market funds. When sure. Harry Kane resigns with the tots, he can go to a money market They're fund, aware right? how sticky these bank savings are, TK. So there's very little incentive to pass it through. But ultimately, the regulator wants to do something about it. I I'm waiting to see how much teeth... These threats actually have this morning, and we'll see, Tom. Is there a Tottenham watchdog? Would you like I mean, a Tottenham watchdog? I'd like watchdog? a Tots watchdog this morning. I'm Maybe another time. Here, we'll do that in a moment. Right now, joining us is someone with one of the toughest jobs in the history of the IMF. Sonia Meskin had to work for Tobias Adrian there, which is pretty heavy lifting. Out of Pennsylvania, LSE, she joins us with BNY Mellon uh, this morning on U.S. Macro. You had to do the Green Book with Tobias and everyone else at the International Monetary Fund on financial stability. What's the financial stability, the arc of financial stability in America look like right now? Well, it probably looks better than after 2008, but uh, that doesn't actually say very much, does it? I think that uh, it's... It's helpful that the balance sheets of both households and corporates have been much, much improved since COVID. What we're seeing, um, it, the effect that we're seeing now from, from that improvement is really in the consumer. And we've been able to withstand a lot of curveballs in the American economy in the last couple of years. Right. These people, people have been predicting a recession for a couple of years now, right? At least a year. And we haven't seen it yet. And we've just now turned the sentiment towards the expectation for a soft landing. Um, but I would say that um, even though the labor market is still quite strong and the balance sheets are quite strong, there's still risks out there. Yeah, there risks out there like commercial, like the Gloom Crew, what Bramo talks about all the time, the commercial real estate. Or there's a lot of questions about the loan business, the leverage loan business as well. Do you at BNY Mellon with the longest dividend since time began? It's like 1630. They've been doing a dividend since the pilgrims hit the rock. And the, and the, answer, is, the, the, the answer is there are these worries out there. Can they intrude into the prosperity? Of America, I think that the bigger the exposure <clears throat> of various uh, actors within the economy, the higher the risk. So if you look at CRE, for example, um, there are different subsets of CRE. And of, of course, uh, office space in major metropolises right. is not coming back, at least in the, uh, in the foreseeable future, to where it was pre-COVID. But there are other elements of CRE, for example, like multifamily mixed use spaces that are doing better. Meanwhile, a lot of people are questioning why we're seeing disinflation. There is the crew that sees a soft landing and that this is just the natural year over year comps coming down and back to uh, the normal pre pandemic. And then you have Bloomberg Economics Anna Wong, who says the disinflation seen in recent data is not the death of the Phillips curve or an anomalous break between net demand and prices. It's because there are real cracks in the economy. Long after supply chains have normalized, it's a downdraft in demand that's driving the current wave of disinflation. Do you agree? I think it's it's still the jury is still very much out on that because we are seeing still quite a strong <clears throat> labor market and we got to ask ourselves ask ourselves why is that the case and the correlation between core services inflation and wages is uh, historically over time has been relatively strong i do think we're seeing a deceleration is it real cracks that are going to put us into a recession next year, or is it just a stabilization from very high levels of activity in the recovery post-COVID? It's still difficult to say. What we're seeing in the market, though, is that people are really reacting to <clears throat> pieces of data that confirm the soft landing and are ignoring parts of the data that may be pointing to a more significant deceleration or even to a potentially you know, very sticky inflation down the road. And the reason why is because of the employment market, as you were saying, 
that that has remained so strong. And we get a number of indicators this week, as we've been talking about throughout the morning. From your vantage point, how soon will we see the softening in the labor market to know quickly enough for the Fed to adjust? In other words, in their data dependency, when will they get the data that actually is true to make those decisions early enough? It's very hard because it's a lagging indicator. Um, and we we are seeing a very big difference now between, again, still, even though it's come down, between job openings and um, actually people looking for jobs. As long as that continues to narrow without people actually losing jobs across industries, I think we're safe enough. But that could change on a dime. And it's very difficult to look at the data that's somewhat backward looking, such as the non-farm payrolls, and see signs of when that, when that may be coming. We've all read lots of research recently about student loan repayments later this year. Torsten Slock for Apollo put out some numbers <coughs> for us just moments ago. Allow me to share them with you. There are a total of 45 million people with student loans. The average monthly student loan payment is around $200. He says resuming student loan payments in October will subtract roughly $9 billion from consumer spending every month or roughly $100 billion a year. Does that move the dial for household spending for you? Is that number big enough? On its own, I, I would be loath to say that it will, but against the background of generally slowing economy, it may. And I think that actually a, high, a higher rate environment, it's hurting consumers already. But as long as the job market stays strong, it has less of an impact than it may on corporates who will, will need to refinance into a higher rate environment in a, in a year or two. Away from the aggregate number as well, Lisa, you go through some of that research. It's about which households, younger versus older, all over again. So... This really raises a question of the Instagram crew who sure. travel to certain places in order to get that Instagram photo and might not do that as much anymore. I mean, how will this impact, you know, Delta's earnings? Or What's the average else? age for crews at the moment? I, I don't that's, know. That's not the younger demo, is it? No. No. You think, no. Maybe no. That's Disney the older cruises. demo. Why are you asking me? No, Since just, when I was a cruise expert. I'm, I'm intrigued. You went on a cruise, didn't you? No, I did not I go on a cruise. I thought you went on a cruise. No. He said you went on a cruise to Norway. I did Norway. not go on a cruise. No, oh, okay. I was Should in never Alaska, believe and I was definitely not in a cruise. Not in Norway, in Alaska, not a cruise. Not a cruise. You're it's in Alaska. Know. Yeah, I did see Where did you get though. Norway from? I thought her people told me that. One okay. of her interns She said it was a cruise. <laughs> so wrong <laughs> place, wrong mode of travel. Do you know she only has liberal arts interns? Do you ever notice that? Okay. No. Yeah. Do you take me for a cruiser? I'm sorry, no offense, but like I'm just wondering. <laughs> Tell us more. That's great. That's great. Leave really, the camera on, Bramo. No, That's no, no, perfect. No, it's okay. I'm Keep just I'm really surprised. I'm so Let's offended. I'm so offended. Sonia, thank you. This was great. Thank you. I won't ask if you cruise, please. Sonia Meskin of BNY Mellon Investment Management. If you're just tuning in, welcome to the program <clears throat> on the equity market on the S&P. We're positive here by 0.12%. Coming up at 8.30 Eastern time, Mark Zandi, Chief Economist over at Moody's Analytics. Looking forward to catching up with him ahead of payrolls later this week. And looking forward to this, Zach Brown, the CEO of McLaren Racing. TK, joining us next on this program. Really well timed. This is a really interesting gentleman. He is somebody, he's a driver. He's somebody who's in the game who actually has done it. And he's got these two young kids at McLaren you know better than me, Lando and Oscar's all I know. Piastri and And he's got to manage them on a daily basis. This is not Alonzo, who's 42 this week, or, you know, Perez and the Belgian guy at Red Bull. This is somebody running two kids right now. So I consider myself the demographic that they all want to speak to, who knows nothing about F1 and is American, because that seems to be... Netflix. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> dabbled in Netflix to understand you what like you guys the, are talking about. You like about the bright orange? Exactly. Okay. But uh, moving on. <laughs> but it, really, I'm curious, as an American who has raced in this sport, bringing it to this country, what is the difference in how F1 will have to change to adapt to an American got, audience. John had a tweet out on, on this, this, this this fixation they have of going to the back end of the race to micro stuff. You put out a tweet, and I, you know, I drives me nuts. You, you're, you're dead on. They don't, you know, and and I, my, I live in mortal fear that they go from British broadcasting to American because the British guys are doing great. Max Verstappen's very outspoken on the difference between what people watch on Netflix and what actually happens yeah. on race day. Yeah. You mean I don't understand fully? No, I'm not I don't. saying that at all. No, I'm just saying that <laughs> I, definitely I think don't. Max believes that they stir up a lot of drama that doesn't exist maybe on, on the program. Yeah. It's all content, isn't it? Equities right now, positive by 0.1%. Formula One and McLaren Racing up next. Formula One. 
is gaining so much momentum, it's gaining viewerships. The Netflix uh, series Drive to Survive have brought in a whole new generation, also much more multi-gender to the franchise. And for us, it's uh, yeah, an absolute key pillar in our sponsorship strategy. That was the Heineken CEO catching up with Bloomberg a little bit earlier on today. It's been amazing to see the attention that Formula One has attracted over the last couple of years, <coughs> TK. I was very happy when you started to take an interest in Premier League football. I'm perhaps a little bit more happy you finally got around to follow this because I always oh. thought this would be the sport for you because it captures all of your interests in one thing. The late great Ken Pruitt used to throw pencils at me because I had no interest in F1. And I have to admit, as with the Heineken gentleman, the Netflix series is the one that got me going. And there's, you know, the British guy married to one of the Spice Girls and there's Tito Tato, the Mercedes guy. I'm sorry, what? And then there's this American guy. <laughs> You're talking guy. about Christian Horner. Yeah, and then right. there's this American <laughs> guy <laughs> who's like, he's like in fury. I didn't even know what McLaren was. And the answer is... You know, I mean, it's, you get to know these people. It's the only sport where, like, you're looking at the managers and the executives in the same way you look at the drivers. Is this a, it's very a, cool. a great lead into our next guest, yeah, Tom. It is. <laughs> Am I doing well here? This is wonderful. Okay. Right now, and this is a joy after what we saw in Belgium to bring in Zach Brown. He's the chief executive officer of McLaren Racing. And to give you an idea of the breadth, the scope, the scale of his history with racing, he actually was in the cars doing it at a very young age, and he's someone that also has a great amount of Americana, including a precious letter from George Washington to someone arguing about the travesty of Benedict Arnold. This is a, this is a renaissance man, uh, John, running things at the August. You told me McLaren was special. It's very special, yeah. and it's a special opportunity to catch up with Zach Brown of McLaren Racing. Zach, wonderful to catch up with you, sir. A difficult weekend compared to the success in Hungary and at Silverstone in the UK as well. Zach, can you catch these Red Bulls this year? Can you get a win? Well, we're trying. We're trying. We need them to blink. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of racing uh, left to go. We're, we're getting closer. Uh, unfortunately, no one's close enough yet. But uh, I would think a win is uh, possible uh, in the second half of the season. It's certainly our goal. What is it about the setup of the car, the developments that you've made over the last several races, Zach, where you think you've made progress and what kind of races on the calendar do you think we can see that a little bit more? Uh, aerodynamics, you know, it's very much an aerodynamics game. Of course, you have to have two great drivers, which we have, and you have to have great pit stops and reliability, but it is an aero game and that is where we've made our biggest gains. Uh, we started that in uh, Austria. I think some of the quicker tracks, so I would think... Uh, Austin, uh, Japan, we should be strong. Abu Dhabi, we should be strong. It's the slow corners we don't like, but who likes going slow anyway? So, uh, but that's where we need to improve. Uh, and, and we've got some more developments coming, but so does everyone in Formula One. So it is right. definitely a development race. Zach, I watched every minute of Belgium and somewhere in the vicinity of lap 31 or 33, there was Zach Brown talking to a 22-year-old kid quietly who had gone out of the race early as well. Oscar Piazzi is 22. At 14, he was basically a professional. That's all these kids do is drive, drive, drive. What were you saying to Oscar Piastri at lap 33 there after he bombed out of the Belgium race? Yeah, I told him a couple things. One, uh, don't worry about it. You know, he had such a great Saturday. He's having a great season, so... Uh, these guys feel like they uh, not only let themselves down, but the team down. And so they need to know we're all in this together. We win together. We lose together. And then also we had a pretty difficult race with our arrow set up. So at that particular moment, uh, Lando was going backwards until we uh, kind of strategically got him in a better place. So I also told him he probably wasn't missing having too much fun yeah. at the moment, just being a little bit lighthearted. And, um, you know, these things happen. He's done a, a fast, fantastic job all year. Explain to our American audience, including a dummy like me, what did Bruce McLaren give you? What does the McLaren name mean to John Farrow in auto racing? It, uh, I mean, it's, he's, he was a legend. He was all about uh, innovation. Uh, he was a driver. He would, uh, was a designer. So, you know, we're very proud to uh, uh, wear the papaya colors, which was Bruce's uh, colors back in the day. And that was actually done so he could have more standout on, on television back in the black and white days. And uh, so he's an inspiration to, to all of us. And he, he was a racer. He was an innovator. He was a designer. 
and of course, a, a, a team owner. So uh, we're the second most successful team in the history of Formula One and something that we're very, uh, very proud of. And we were also the only team to have won what's called the Triple Crown, which is the 24 Hours of Le Mans and the Indy 500 and, of course, the Monaco Grand Prix. And it's something that we can hope to do again in the future. Zach, as you try to plow further into the U.S., is this something that Formula One has tried to do? Is I'm learning and I'm one of the people who are becoming the adopters uh, here. Where is the distinction, the overlap between Formula One and NASCAR? How competitive is that at a time when NASCAR already has such a, a cult following in the U.S.? <laughs> and Formula One has a very different type of energy coming from Europe. Yeah, I think they're they're complementary. They're they're different. You know, they're they're probably uh, have almost the same similarities between uh, baseball and and basketball because uh, they're they're radically different as far as the type of of racing. So uh, uh, a little bit of a different demographic and, and psychographic. Obviously, Formula One is is very global, where NASCAR's uh, a domestic uh, sport. But I think. All motorsports uh, help each other, so I, I think there's uh, room for both, uh, including uh, IndyCar, which is much more like uh, Formula One. It's just awesome to see how big Formula One has got in America as quickly as it has, and I think um, Netflix obviously has a lot to do with that, as does the Austin Grand Prix, the Miami Grand Prix, and the uh, uh, soon-to-come uh, Vegas Grand Prix, which is going to be off the charts. As a lot of purists probably feel that the Netflix series perhaps inaccurately reflects some of the drama or the lack thereof, as Max Verstappen, uh, as John was pointing out, has noted, as an American who has been in a sport that really has been dominated by European presence, how does the sport have to change to really become as popular in the U.S.? Well, I think it is changing and a lot of credit to uh, Liberty who acquired the sport, you know, five, six years ago. I think Netflix is a great example. That would have probably not happened uh, with previous ownership because the, the industry, the sport would not have wanted the cameras on the inside of the sport. It was kind of a wasn't a, an inclusive sport. And I think now we're very digitally savvy. We've embraced the fan. We're all about the fan and things like Netflix, where we're showing people about our great sport. And I've seen some of those comments, which uh, are a little disappointing because I think they're a bit um, inaccurate in, in the sense of we're capturing our great sport. When Netflix puts together the content, they'll sometimes pick and pull because they're trying to illustrate a, a point. So we as the racers will see, for instance, oh, that was a clip of our pit crew from Monaco, but they're showing us in Italy, but it kind of doesn't change the narrative. So I think we're a little bit too close to it. And because right. Formula One's all about the details, we get a little bit wound up when the detail's a little bit inaccurate. Zach, tell me how the commercial agreements have developed over the last couple of years. Let's just say, for example, we wanted to put Bloomberg surveillance on the side of <clears throat> Mando's car. Let's just say. Let's just say. <laughs> what, what's the cost adjusting. of that now compared Take to what it offer. was? Several years ago, Zach, how much has the price of that increased? It's probably gone up uh, twofold in, in five years. And, and I think what's great, though, is the exposure has gone up fourfold. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's all about value for, for money. But the uh, demand, I mean, if we look at our, our partners, right. Google, Cisco, Dell, Goldman Sachs, I mean, these companies were not considering Formula One five years ago, and, and now you've got the world's greatest companies right. joining those that were already there. So it's it's been an unbelievably yeah. commercial success. Uh, Zach, real quickly, and, and by the way, you know, John and I think we can piece together $5,000 to get Bloomberg surveillance <laughs> on the side <laughs> of the car. You guys are always tweaking the cars. Now, you've got a summer break like Farrell has a summer break. I mean, John's taken off all of August into September. You go from Belgium to Netherlands. Is your car going to be tweaked and different for Netherlands, or do you actually take a real European holiday? No, well, a bit of both, but you know everything's about advanced planning. So we will have uh, new bits, if you'd like, on our car in Holland, but those have already been developed. The shutdown is for the technical team, is mandatory. We can't even send an email. So I'm going to go to America wow. and spend some time with our IndyCar team because I, I, you can't keep me away from a racetrack. But no, we are. it is a very genuine, you cannot touch the race car for two weeks. Uh, you can't even communicate 
about the race car, but that's all planned in, so our developments are already that ready so cool. for Holland. I'm having that written into my contract I was going to say, is everybody, <laughs> Zach, it. Brad, Qantas, Qantas, Zach, did great. you just hear that? Zach Brown of McLaren Racing. Zach, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, and good luck for the rest of the season. Some recent success from McLaren. Head in the Huge. right direction, yes. Tom. It looks better and better. And, we, and these we two young kids more. are rock stars. Very cool. Michael <laughs> Hervis on the market, up next. I think this goes higher for longer, and I'm talking about equity markets right now. The data continues to come in pretty good. There's been tremendous momentum in the consumer. As we look forward, we think that those excess savings are basically spent. We're still actually a long way from price stability. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Staggering into August is what we do. And we stagger tomorrow to the ISM data. John Farrell taught me it matters. Within all of we got earnings, economics, yeah. and all that, John, we start tomorrow with that first indicator, ISM. You make us all sound drunk, Tom, going into the data tomorrow, <laughs> staggering towards I'm off my sabbatical. Leave me alone. <laughs> Amazon and Apple on Thursday. TK, it's a big week to kick off the month of August just around the corner. It's a big week to do the data. And as I've said earlier, I think the earnings story here and the great gloom mis misguess that we got on earnings and all that is part of the economic data. Apple and Amazon equate to ISM. Typically, we would say the market's not the economy and we'd pick out the tech names that have raced to these double digit gains year to date and say they're tech. They're not representative of right. the economy, but the economy has been doing much better than expected. And there are several stories outside of big tech which speak to the resilience of discretionary spending in America. We joked about cruise lines a little bit earlier this morning. Right. The airlines as well have been a big story for 2023. Yeah, maybe it's two Americas, Lisa. What I would go to, we mentioned this earlier, is very quietly the story of July underreported as West Texas Intermediate, 81 the barrel, rounded up, Brent crude, $86 a barrel is up a nice percentage. And a lot of people are wondering why it didn't happen sooner, given that everybody is going around, whether it's cruise Demand's ships or whether it's airplanes. Uh, right, demand is better. <clears throat> the actual consumption of gas, of oil, has actually gone to some new records. So this isn't necessarily either an economy or a world moving away from fossil fuels or people who are slowing down, which raises a question of why it isn't even higher at a time when people say the supply-demand uh, balance is completely out of whack, Tom. As a deep into my sabbatical, the provost called and said, that I have to publish off it. Do you know what my paper's on? What's that? It's a that? working paper. It's in peer review right now. Okay. The Tao of Tang. Mm. It's going to be very good. Anyways, off my sabbatical, what <laughs> intruded the was the Bank of Japan. And I'm sorry, the Bank of Japan intrudes again. I got a 142.22 on yen. I guess the yen's done nothing, but the Bank of Japan has acted. So the Bank of Japan, in their own words, haven't dropped yield curve control. They're just going to tolerate some breach of the 0.5 ceiling mm. that they've had for a while and pledged to come in at 1% every single day if they need to, but then they came in at 0.6%. So I think we're still asking the same questions from Friday. Is there a line in the sand? Do they <clears> care about pace or levels? Have they shifted policy, tweaked it, whatever word you want to pick on Friday to make the easing more sustainable? Or is this a genuine step towards tightening? <laughs> and the fact that we're all sitting here trying to figure it out speaks to right. the ambiguity that you and I have been talking about, Lisa, for the last couple of days. It is by design. And at the moment, it's not having any negative consequences for now. Lisa, if it starts to induce volatility and the market starts to test them because they're not providing that clarity, then we've got a very, very different story. And if you take it a step further, is the strategic ambiguity that the Bank of Japan is executing only possible because we're also getting strategic ambiguity from the ECB what, and uh, from the Federal me, Reserve. Where does strategic ambiguity come from? It was Friday, right? <laughs> it was Jeff Yu. But he actually... Uh, it no, was, but somebody it was, mentioned this, like the Bank of Japan or somebody? No, that was Jeff Yu, I believe. Was it Jeff Yu? And Mike Gapin of Bank of America oh, that was to describe you. the That's Federal right. Reserve. That's right, you brought that up. Sure. But the, okay, the idea here is... It's a phrase everyone's is, thrown around, Tom, at the moment. The idea here is they are not looking to provide non-guidance. Right. They don't want guidance. Right. They want the markets to go on their yeah. own accord according to the data and not driven by any yeah. expectation of their policy. My, my strategic ambiguity is the Red Sox couldn't get it done not once but twice against the San Francisco Giants uh, this weekend. John, let's start the data check here. I'm going to go to the all-time high measure. How far are these equity indices away from the all-time high? SPX up 5%, Dow up 3%, NASDAQ 100 adjusted rebalanced up 5% wow. as well. We're getting there. Wow. And some people still calling it a bear market. 
after games yeah, are some close to 30%. Are. Not Michael Purvis will get there in a from moment. From the October lows. Equity futures right now positive by 0.1% on the S&P 500. There's that lift in crude at 1%. Lisa on top of that story, $81.40 <coughs> on WTI. Yield just about unchanged, 395.88. If you are just tuning in, the data out of Europe, GDP at least has some growth. That's where the line is in Europe right now. That's the bar. <laughs> But CPI is still a problem. Core inflation in the Five. Eurozone, 5.5%, yeah. Tom, with That's an ECB still yeah. umming and ahhing about what they're going to do in September. We launch into August right now with the most important interview of the day. He's a tall back in capital advisors, and with decades of experience, he writes a piercing direct Note, Michael Purvis joins us, the CEO of Tallback. And Mike, for congratulations on being in the market, saying I've got to participate in the market. What's the now what on a second leg? You bounce off 74, 73 recession, big pop in 75. Nobody in January of 76 was ready for the second leg. How do you frame the second leg of this bull market right now? Well, I think it's really going to come down to rotation. I mean, the big tech has, has clearly done a lot of impressive uh lifting here. They've blazed the path forward. They've had the most aggressive PE expansion. I think too much PE expansion. Um, you know, you look at NVIDIA's earnings, uh, which have been, you know, bottoms up street consensus estimates have doubled over the last quarter, kind of steal some thunder from what's going to be coming, I think, later this summer. So I, I, I'm I, not sure, you know, the AI excitement, you know, I think we're going to go into much more of a Missouri uh, show me type of mentality on on uh, a lot of the AI narrative. Um, the rest of the market, however, value and cyclicals, you know, it's been a tough thing to own because we're supposed to get this recession, right, <laughs> at some point there. That said, <laughs> uh, the valuation, it's night and day, and the spread of valuations between a, uh, a lot of the cyclical and value indices you, and the big tech is at record right. wise. Where right do now. you acquire this morning? on a sector basis? Energy, Look, banks, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think one of your guests earlier this morning uh, stole some of my thunder. Uh, energy and, and industrials, I think, look really very, very compelling. I think there's a, there's structural stories there um, with, you know, regard to, you know, some of the big uh, sort of, you know, sort of second wave of capital expenditures that's happening uh, in the United States. Part of the ESG uh, story is really much tied to the industrialization. Relocalization is tied to industrialization. And, and then on the energy companies, you know, I, you know, you look at, you were talking about crude rallying, you know, it's up 12% off the recent lows with, um, without the benefit of a, you know, weakening dollar or a surging China, right? And I think that's sort of speaking to the fact that maybe we don't get to that 120 oil that was, you know, thrown around or 150 oil is thrown around a year ago. But, but, if there's a higher floor and a more stable floor, which I think there is, given the sort of the new era of, of supply considerations from the big energy companies, uh, you're going to see, you know, those are those are cheap stocks there. Right now we're talking about the details of tweaking around the edges. And yet a number of guests have come on and said, look, the data is really confusing. Right now, don't fight momentum. What's the point? It's yeah. August. I mean, or almost August. I mean, do you kind of adhere to that I, as well. I, I tell you, I, in, in, the, in the number of years I've been doing this, it, I've never been more sort of intellectually tormented by the fact you look at some of these charts, and it, it could be sugar futures, it could be whatever, right? It's a chart. The charts look incredible, right? Incredibly bullish. Like, you don't want to get short that chart. Then you step back and you think of, okay, wait a second, we're looking in 2024. I've been very constructive or very... Um, uh, sort of non-bearish, I should say, on the economy coming into this year, right? Um, there, uh, but still, you're going to see, and I'm very uh, of the view that we're going into a different, higher nominal GDP world for a lot of reasons. There, without all that said, nominal GDP will come in in 2024 from what we've been using, and as that happens, you're going to see some earnings deflate. I don't think it's going to be negative. I just think we're going to go into like a four or five percent index earnings growth. And that is that enough to justify 20 times on the S&P 500? So does that mean that you are joining the FOMO or that you're not? Are you pushing back I, against I, it? I, I am. You, I am invented jo FOMO. Well, I, I'm, <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am with this, right? I am not recommending uh, to my clients bearish trades right now, except on uh, a couple of individual specific stocks, like right? Well, I think, frankly, NVIDIA is looking <laughs> okay. is cracking. But but there, would I go short the Qs just yet? Probably not. 
um, uh, there. I'm not bullish on the VIX either. Um, I, I actually think there's a lot of reasons to think that the VIX is going to stay in the sort of sub-14 mm -hmm. range for some time. You codified a study of ADX, uh, uh, of AX, uh, the uh, Asian index, X right. Japan, the uh, JP Morgan index. How do you interpret the Bank of Japan dynamics of the last number of days? Well, How does that redound over to the rest of the Pacific well, Rim? Well, let, let me bring that back to the U.S. Treasury market first, because I think it is really, really important. And you know, if you look at where, you know, it was just, a, what, a year and a half ago, it was all, you know, $17 trillion of a negative yielding debt, right, a lot from Europe and, and of course, from, from Japan. Uh, you know, the boons are in a much very different place today. Um, and JGBs are, look, slowly after after so many years starting to wake up and, and get out of that. And there's no, I think that will reinforce rate volatility into the U.S. Um, and I think that will uh, reinforce a higher floor in U.S. Treasury yields. I think it, it, it's just, it's inevitable. I don't think it's a fast, sudden process. You know, you talked about, you know, remember back in August of 2015, the Chinese shock devaluation, Tom, you know, that was really what got that VIX correlation with the um, ADXY uh, so tight. I don't think that is happening this time around. I think it's a slower moving but very structural force that also sort of speaks into this sort of higher nominal world we're going I to. I can't believe that was eight years ago. I just kind of not stick it about where did that go? Where did yes. that go? Are there vulnerable bond markets at the moment where there is a bigger presence of the Japanese based investor that you think perhaps? may face a little bit of pain as Japanese investors start to bring money home. Well, look, I think, um, it, again, I, I, I'm looking at life more through the sort of a U.S.-centric lens here. I'm not Damien Sassauer, you know, sure. worrying about, you I know, Malaysia. It's lucky for um, you. Uh, International <laughs> flow dynamics But, but, but from a flow point of view, yeah, no, I do, I do think, I do think there, it's going to be, again, nothing sharp and sudden. I do think there, it will mean that, you know, here we are sort of edging up in 4% on the 10-year. A lot of people th wouldn't think we were going to be there. I think we're going to stay there longer. I think this is one of those contributing factors. If you look at the you know, SOFR futures over the, you know, forget what's happening in the next 12 months. That's kind of tired news in a way. Like, look at years three, four, and five on the SOFR curve. Those are lifting higher into a new place. And I think that's a little bit of a tell that we're going into sort of a, you know, a higher floor for treasuries. And I do think that, you know, for all this talk about, you know, headline is crashing in the U.S., yeah, it has right. been coming in quite quickly, right? But if you look at the last three spikes above 6% CPI over the last 50 years, we never got to 2% after those those spikes there. So I think that's a, 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 something we've got to be watching really closely. Michael, good to see you. As but, always, Michael Purvis there of Tallback and Capital Advisors. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. A lift on the S&P 500 going into big earnings and some big data later this week with payrolls on Friday. Equity futures firmer by 016 at 8.30 Eastern time, so 18 minutes from now, we'll catch up with Mark Zandi of Moody's Analytics. Looking forward to that conversation before payrolls on Friday. The estimates at the moment, the median's 200K. If you break it down on the Bloomberg terminal in our survey at the moment, so let's take the top two ranked economists over the last couple of years. So number one, Stephen Gallagher, SockGen, he's looking for 190. Number two, Stephen Stanley, now of Santander, 270. Tom, so they're your top two Economists on the street when it comes to forecasting payrolls, looking for something in and around two, maybe a little bit higher? All I know is I'm not going to look at ADP. I still don't see the correlation between ADP. Everyone said that until the last ADP report. On Friday, but... And then boom. I, I, I Look, we've just been so, so, so wrong on this. I'm going to take a three-month moving average, and it's a fully employed America. When it goes, I do agree. When it goes, it will go quickly. But it hasn't gone. Well, yet. claims aren't breaking out, are they? They're breaking no. down. Yeah, at least they're going the other way. Well, and this is the reason why jolts might be interesting tomorrow. The job openings data that we got. But Sonia Meskin on earlier said that this can move really quickly, right? And so this is my question: When will we actually start to see this lagging indicator show weakness that everyone's waiting for? I mean, you pointed to Neil Kashkari. This is what he said on Face the Nation. I personally don't think that's realistic. That we're going to get some sort of decline in inflation without some sort of pain in the labor market. There's going to be a cost to the labor market. You know what's interesting? A little bit later, we get the senior loan officer opinion survey and no one is talking about it. And three months ago, that's all anybody was talking about. And tumbleweed exactly. this Monday morning from New York City. Good morning.
every BOJ meeting is probably going to be live up ahead. I think everything is on the table. We know the trajectory is towards tightening in comprehensive conditions, the phrase uh, that they're using, and uh, markets, yen, um, XP markets, and in particular, JGB's global fixed income will need to react accordingly. Every trading day is live for the BOJ at the moment, it seems. Jeff Yu, Senior Market Strategist at BNY Mellon. Those comments coming after the Bank of Japan tweet, what they call yield curve control. Basically, they have a target rate, they have a ceiling, and then they told us the ceiling wasn't really a ceiling, it wasn't rigid, they would tolerate some kind of breach of it, coming at 1% every single day if they need to, and then didn't get anywhere near 1%, and they came into the market today. So make sense of that. Everyone else is trying to. On the screen today, what you do get off the back of it is a weaker Japanese yen, dollar yen 142, that <coughs> currency pair firm by three quarters of one percent the broader story in the market at the moment is a lift to equities to kick off the trading week this monday morning good morning to you all equity features up by 0.15 percent on the s p 500 yields just about unchanged to up a single basis point tom on a 10-year 396 28 <clears throat> and that stealth rally in crude that hasn't got a ton of attention yeah. really relative to the monthly move we've seen so far 81.47, we're high, Tom, by another 1.1%. Yeah, I haven't done the work. Let's do the work right now. You can do this, folks, in the Bloomberg terminal with the TE function, Tom Edward. You take Brent crude, and we're riding the rail, John, up two standard deviations. I didn't realize how low we got. In June, we were down to $73 a barrel, and we're enjoying $86 a barrel right now. It's a moonshot up. That extrapolation, you pop through 90 somewhere. You know, we're on the plane to Jackson Hole, and we're at $90 a barrel. That's the high the gasoline price again. That all over yeah, again. Yeah, you know. maybe. We'll have to see. That's where we are. Right now, we are going to have the correct question for you to be briefed into August on the Pacific Rim and very much so what's going on in Japan. Win Thin is global head of currency strategy, Brown Brothers Harriman, with all of his work at the International Monetary Fund and just the thoughts here on the ramifications 12 time zones away. Dr. Thin, I look at this and let me start with China. What does it mean for China if eventually in Japan I have yield up price down? Well, I think it's not it's something that not only China has to think about, but really anywhere around the world. The world is, has accustomed uh, to basically sopping up Japanese uh, funds that have gone elsewhere to chase yield, right? Zero negative yields in Japan. You go chase it in emerging markets, in the U.S. Treasuries, China. Um, but, you know, we're, we're in that pivot point where all of a sudden Japanese rates are going to start going up. Now, it's, they're probably not going to rise as, as quickly as, as many would hope. It's, we'll talk about the Bank of Japan operation later, I'm sure. But they are taking it very cautiously, so we're not going to have a huge jump in yields and a huge sort of turnaround in capital flows. But at the margin, I do think that we'll see uh, more <clears throat> Japanese uh, funds come home and be more domestically focused as yields rise. But again, this is a multi-year process. It's a multi-year process. We have to think of the immediacy of $86 Brent crude again on the Pacific Rim. Uh, I was away Friday. We had Jay Pulaski on, who I think has just been brilliant on this. Is a general statement, are you thumb up on the Pacific Rim? I mean, I know there's oil demand, but the, the interlinking parts of the Pacific Rim, do you see it constructively with optimism into 2024? Well, well Tom, let's, let's bring it full circle back to the China question, because overnight we had some very weak official um, Chinese PMI readings for, for July. And that continues a multi-month trend. But, you know, we had this burst of optimism in December when China reopened, but we, we, since then it's been nothing but disappointment. We've had some pronouncements of some stimulus here and there, but really nothing uh, really concrete. It's all very vague about the amounts and how it's going to be funded, et cetera, et cetera. So they're saying all the right things, but when all said and done, the economy continues to slow in China. That has ripple effects for a lot of the, the sort of Chinese dependent economies, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, obviously, Japan even, Germany. So, so look, if the Asian Pacific region has, has in general very good fundamentals. Uh, we're talking about emerging Asia, but... Um, but it's always been really, well, I won't say always, really the last two decades been been dependent on this giant export machine out of China. And as China turns inward, doesn't sort of, you know, sort of uh, go back into this export, global export machine that it once was, it really has global ramifications. I think we're looking at very, very slow growth, uh, really in, 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 in uh, emerging Asia uh, and Japan as well. And high oil prices don't help. I think most of the region imports oil. Uh, that's bad for inflation numbers. So it, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, I think I'm a little more constructive on LATAM in terms of emerging markets, um, but, uh, but I, I'm very more, much more cautious on Asia at this point, mostly because of China. How difficult is it to have some sort of conviction and a trade 
Chinese currency, but right now, even more so, the Japanese yen, given the confusing rhetoric out of the Bank of Japan and the fact that they're going to tip their, put their thumb on the scale in some way that we don't even know at every single daily trading session. Yeah. Now, Lisa, you really have really just sort of uh, hit the nail on the head there. So for the last three or four weeks, you've heard you know, leaks and comments from the Bank of Japan that they weren't going to do anything at this meeting. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, Thursday afternoon, North America, we get this leak story from uh, Japanese uh, newswire that, hey, they, were they going to discuss a tweak in the yield control? So it really caught, I think, a lot of people off guard. We had a big move in the markets during the afternoon. But when all said and done, it was really sort of a, a, really a very puzzling move. They, they, they kept yield curve control and they kept the target, but they made it a sort of moving target in terms of the, the upper limit. And I think it was a very half-hearted attempt to sort of do something. Uh, I, I think they squandered a lot of credibility for really a, a lot of nothing. Uh, the equity market is up and the yen is down. That tells me the markets really don't believe uh, Bank of Japan. If I can just say quickly one, I'll, I haven't talked about this in months, but it's, it's something my, my old professor at Columbia, Robert Mundell, Professor Mundell, the brilliant Professor Mundell, had something called the impossible trinity. Basically what boils down to is you can't have free capital control, uh, flows and, and also control interest rates and the exchange rate. You can't do all three. The Bank of Japan is trying to do all three. The, where it's going to leak is the currency rate. I think that's where the pressure is going to be let out. So I think I, I'm more convinced than ever that we, I, we should buy dollar yen. We, we are headed to 145, if not higher. Interesting, which also uh, sort of might fuel some of your bets on Latin American currencies as well, because as Damien Sasso was saying earlier, a lot of those bets have been carry trades financed by the yen. How fragile are some of these Latin American trades based on what happens from Japan? In other words, how much has the weaker yen fueled a mass influx of capital into Latin America? Yeah, uh, very much so, at least I think it really into any sort of high yielding uh, currencies. So it's interesting you bring that up because last week we had a couple of uh, surprises uh, in, in emerging markets. Chile delivered a dovish surprise on Friday. They cut 100 basis points. And to me, that's where the tipping point right now is for emerging market currencies. We have the developing market rates going up, 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 up. And all of a sudden, you have the emerging markets trying to cut rates at the same time. And it's, it's you know, as we always know, the emerging markets has to have some sort of risk premium built in. And a lot of these policymakers in emerging markets are going to test that thesis. Um, I, I expect if Chile continues to cut rates aggressively, that the Chilean pace will come under a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, the best um, performing emerging currencies this past year has been the high yielders, uh, obvious, for obvious reasons, because the carry trade uh, and strong fundamentals. But as that cushion falls, I, I do think it's going to be very worrisome. So I expect policymakers to, to really weigh this, um, sort of the, the trade off between, OK, let's boost growth, but uh, at the expense of weaker <laughs> currency. That's going to feed into inflation loop, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, a lot of moving parts for policymakers all over the world. I would just say that I'm very disappointed that the Bank of Japan uh, is an outlier in terms of, of just not communicating well with the markets. You know, every other central bank, the Fed, the ECB, everyone around the world is trying to sort of keep markets calm, have them know what's coming or what they think is coming. And for the Bank of Japan to throw a spanner in the works on Friday was, was really, really, to me, quite shocking. And, and I'm not really quite sure it was worth it, honestly. Well, when just to finish on that, is that just an experience leading a central bank? We've seen moments like that from Chairman Powell and President Lagarde when they first had their first terms. That's correct. But he did have a, a sort of a, a, um, a model go off. Remember, the, uh, Mr. Kuroda gave us a little surprise in December uh, before he left. So to me, he's sort of re repeating the pattern. Um, it really didn't do a whole lot. Um, so... <laughs> Again, yes, you could. I, I can be generous, Jonathan. I, I, I actually appreciate you saying that. <laughs> Don't uh, accuse it, me of that. Know, it is growing pain. <laughs> generous. It is growing pain. But <laughs> central okay, bankers. The world, yeah, you, you're seeing it's lessons where you must be clear and concise. I'll do better next time, Win. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Win there. No, nothing wrong with that. Brand <laughs> Brothers Harriman. <laughs> appreciate it. TK. That was brilliant. Buried in there was the thin Columbia take on his uh, advisor, Robert Mundell, who was a good friend of this show. This idea of the impossible trinity that Japan or any other nation faces when they make long-term bets, strategic bets, as Japan has made. It's just simple, and you can use the uh, phrase from the TV show years ago, this math does not compute. It just doesn't work. I'm going to step away, Tom, and head to the studio. <clears throat> Are the you? other studio. Are you? Uh, yeah. 35 minutes. Jim they Bianco, have a, they have a Bianco Research. Than we do. Son of Desire of Franklin Templeton, Stuart Kaiser of City. On the data this week, the central bank lack of communication and the earnings on Thursday. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Surveillance, Lisa Bramwitz and Tom Kane. Mr. Farrell on assignment. You know, he goes to his show early because they have a better breakfast there. They oh, yeah? Got, yeah. Lots by the time it's 6 a.m., we're doing, like, you know, Pop-Tarts and all that. By the time they get to the 9 a.m. breakfast here at Bloomberg, it's, like, pretty fancy. Yeah, we get you know, Lucky Charms, Benedict. and he gets organic eggs. Benedict eggs. and, you mm. know, and, and all that. Anyways, Farrell's off uh, getting ready for the next hour, which is a good and beautiful uh, thing. We welcome all of you here. Mark Zandi coming up in a moment. Very important conversation on glass half full, half empty on the American economy. But right now, we'll whisper into the microphone because the <laughs> king of whisper data, Michael McKee, is here on a very busy week. What's the, what, what's the whisper number that matters this week? Is it <laughs> is it jobs or is it something oh, else? Well, we don't do a whisper numbers <clears throat> on a lot of different things, but uh, jobs is going to be Probably the most important thing of the week. I'm just looking up the whisper number now. Right now, uh, no, that's ISM. We do that for <laughs> tomorrow. The uh, whisper number is 47, so people think we're going to have a weak number. But the number for jobs is 194 at the moment. A little bit lighter a than little the bit survey. Lighter, but we're going to get a lot of data this week that will influence what all those late arriving forecasts will be. Where will we be at 9 a.m. on Friday, given the compendium of data starting with jolts, which you've told me really matters tomorrow, ADP and all that? Where we, What would you guess is we're going to feel Friday at 9 o'clock? Uh, we'll, we'll feel glad the week is over because it's a very, uh, very busy week for economic data. Uh, but I, the, the underlying feeling has to be that we will see a little bit of a slowdown in terms of job creation, but not much movement overall in the uh, jobs numbers. The uh, <coughs> unemployment rate is not expected to change. And we're basically thinking that uh, things have slowed down, but they're not falling off a cliff. But we start well, they'll, they'll, we'll get some interest with the senior loan officer survey this afternoon. Although Jay, so Powell, that's a big deal. It it's one of those numbers that becomes a big deal when it just fits into the narrative, and that's Lisa been the was narrative. making a big deal. I'm like, is this a big deal? I don't know. It's a big deal. Did, I mean, for years, I couldn't get you guys to put me on to talk about slews. But, but now, <laughs> now you want to talk slews. Uh, Jay Powell said it's about as you'd expect, and he also said earlier that he thought the bank issues were behind us. So I don't think we're going to see a whole lot in there other than some tightening, <clears throat> maybe because that's what banks do when rates go way up. But then you got right. ISM tomorrow, ADP, and. Right. Jobless claims on Thursday, all that will feed into right. what we get for the July jobs report in terms of forecasts. August 1, tomorrow I'm dusting off the cowboy boots for Jackson Hole. Has Jackson Hole changed in the last couple of weeks? Is there a different anticipation for it? I don't think it's changed in the last couple of weeks, but it certainly changed from last year. Uh, mm -hmm. We... We know what the Fed is going to do, which is we don't know what the Fed is going to do. They've made it clear that they're ambiguous at this point, that they could go higher, they could go lower, and it will depend <clears throat> on the data. And Powell gave us a list of all the numbers they're going to be watching, a couple of CPIs, a couple of yeah. jobs reports, a yeah. couple of PCEs, before we get to the next Fed meeting. And so uh, any one meeting like this, uh, or I mean, rather, any one week like this isn't going to make a, a big difference in terms of what the market thinks the Fed is going to okay. do. They'll be watching other things. <clears throat> I can tell you, though, that um, for those who are going to risk it and not be here this week, mm -hmm. Bloomberg TV is channel 105 out in the Hamptons. So, you know, we, you can oh, continue to watch surveillance yeah. and right. we'll give you all the numbers and then you can yeah. go to the beach. That's Sonali Bassic TV out there. That's, yeah, it's good. You know, Michael McKee, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, this is a joy. Mark Zandi is a name you may not know. He's chief economist at Moody's Analytics. But he codified optimism in the depths of the 2008 recession, the great financial crisis. He's written a couple books on it, but far more Mark Zandi said, and I'm going to say early 08, early 09, you know what? We're going to come out of this. We're going to be resilient. We're going to move forward. Dr. Zandi joins us now, chief economist at Moody's Analytics. Do you have the optimism you had then now, Mark? Can you look out one year, three years, five years? and see an America of productivity and real GDP gain? Yeah, Tom, I can. I think, uh, what's that uh, Warren Buffett uh, adage, uh, don't bet against the American economy? I think <laughs> that's pretty accurate. I mean, it goes up, it goes down, it goes all around. But cutting through all the ups and downs, the uh, economy right. is resilient. And I, I do think we have our prospects are good long run. Almost to the point of uh, Romer of New York University, our Nobel laureate on technology and growth, 
the technology miracle we have in America right now, witness these stocks and all the AI and, and all that. How do you overlay technology now as an optimistic force for America? Well, it's, uh, it's key to driving the, those productivity gains, uh, you know, technology, innovation, entrepreneurism, uh, you know, that's what makes the American economy exceptional, makes it tick. Uh, you know, if you look at the data, though, productivity growth has been pretty pedestrian, pretty tepid. I mean, one and a half percent per annum over the past three, five, six years. Uh, and that's, you know, down from the 2% kind of per annum growth we got between World War II and the financial crisis. So we need more innovation. We need more entrepreneurism. We need, we need more business formation. Uh, I'd say bring it on. Uh, we need some of that AI magic to kind of wash over the economy to get that productivity number up. Because as you know, Tom, the demographics are uh, difficult, right? Uh, you know, I'm I'm a boomer. I'm going to age out uh, of the workforce. A lot of me or uh, folks like me are going to age out. Uh, immigration is not going right. to uh, save the day. So if right. we're going to get you know, stronger growth numbers, we're going to get, we get, we need to see right. those productivity gains, and we need to yeah. see that innovation. Lisa, Zandy's not going to age out. He's cut and chiseled. I mean, he's he's, <laughs> he's like you no. know he's in Philadelphia doing the Eakins, you know, crew down the river thing. You know, like the paintings from the night. He just, he just like forty miles. <laughs> He's going to defy age, Mark. That I'm curious. Like me, Tom. A that lot really of like me. a lot of people are talking about how it's going to be really difficult to track some of this data and follow it because it's backward looking. Uh, so, what are you looking for for that forward looking indicator? Is it the senior loan officer opinion survey that we get out at two? Is it some of the ISM surveys that we get later in the week? Well, Lisa, you know, I think my favorite near-term indicator, you know, where we're going to be over the next six, say, six, nine months is actually consumer confidence. Uh, you know, the, the conference board measure in particular, I find uh, useful. You know, at the end of the day, particularly in the context of this debate, recession, no recession, because at the end of the day, a recession is a loss of faith. You know, consumers lose faith that they're going to hold on to their job and they pack it in, stop spending and and uh, of course, businesses lose faith that they can sell whatever it is that they produce and they start laying off. We get into this kind of self-reinforcing cycle. And historically, when confidence starts to move south in a big way, in a consistent way, not too soon thereafter, we go into recession. But as you know, we got some data points last week uh, from uh, the conference board and the University of Michigan survey, and they, they all look pretty good. I mean, in fact, confidence improved. So, you know, uh, hard to say what the world looks like a year from now, but I, I think I can state with a high level of confidence through the end of this year, we're going to remain recession free. If that's the case, then what does that say about the ability for the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, to really affect some sort of change in the economic condition? In other words, are we looking at a U.S. economy that's pretty insensitive to interest rate increases and maybe actually have a much higher terminal rate? Because it can keep chugging along, regardless of the fastest rate hiking cycle going back some 40 years. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. I mean, uh, inflate, the key here is inflation, and inflation's coming in uh, in a pretty <clears throat> graceful way. I mean, uh, and, and all the trend lines look pretty good. I mean, I forecast lots of things. Some of, the, of those things I feel very confident in, some not so much. This I feel very confident in. I think inflation is going to come in. We know vehicle prices are going to decline. We know the cost of the growth in the cost of housing services is going to slow. We know electricity prices are going to come in. So I think inflation <clears> is coming in here pretty nicely to the degree that the Federal Reserve doesn't have to do anything. They've done all they need to do. We're at the terminal rate. We're good. Money good. So I, I just mm -hmm. leave things alone and let it uh, let the economy, you know, do its thing. And I think we'll be fine. And Dr. Zandy, if we make the assumption that this is a Fed that is more data dependent than ever, if they are what's called ex post is we have never seen, what is the price, the damage, what is the risk we have if it's a Fed that has to act after the fact? Well, uh, I mean, they, they, what, what choice do they have? They have to focus on the data that they have and the, the, the data stream that's coming in. Uh, they've got a forecast, but it's you know obviously very dependent on the data that, that, that they have. So I, you know, I'm not sure what the alternative is. You know, uh, from their perspective, uh, you, you know, they've got to look at a lot of different things and, and they do. And I think they have to weigh them. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're tied to the data like everyone else. I, I will point out, though, 
uh, it, this life's very difficult for them, you know, at, at points like this because uh, the data is based on surveys. The response rates to the surveys rate have been declining. The quality of the results that we're getting has has fallen, and it's it's hard to tease out the the so-called signal from the noise, and so it makes it a lot more difficult for them to get it right. But you know, again, at the end of the day, they're they're slaves to the data. Uh, they, they've got to uh, they've got to be beholden to what that data says. Are you saying with inflation coming down gracefully that it's going back to where it was pre-pandemic, and that most of the increase in inflation was just <clears throat> pandemic-related distortions? Yeah, exactly. A Russian war. I mean, I think those two things, those two supply shocks, pretty massive, and uh, they kind of uh, you know conflated uh, to because uh, they came on at the, roughly the same time conflated and uh, caused inflation expectations to jump. And then that's when inflation really metastasized, uh, you know, got into the wage wage structure and you got into, you know, wages driving prices, drive, prices driving wages, the whole wage price dynamic. So, but at the end of the day, it's those two supply shocks that, you know, are at the root of the right. high inflation. And this, as those supply shocks fade from view, uh, and they're still right. they're still there, right? I mean, the, the vehicle prices I mentioned earlier, uh, they're, that's supply chain related. Right. Uh, you know, Japan and Germany can't produce because of supply chain issues. But as they fade away, then inflation should you know come back down, you know, reasonably gracefully. There's some room for the right. Fed to slow the economy down. I mean, it has been growing too quickly. It doesn't want to see unemployment go any lower. But the heavy lifting here is is on inflation is really about uh, getting to the right. other side of the pandemic and the Russian war. Mark, I got 30 seconds. What's your 12 months forward real GDP number? Uh, Tom, I think it's going to be around one, one and a half percent, just below trend, mm. you know, potential potentials, too. So that'll allow the un uh, unemployment rate to tick a little bit higher, but, you know, well above zero. So I think we'll remain right. recession free. Mark Sandy, thank you so much. He's with Moody's uh, Analytics. Uh, Lisa, you mentioned Moody's and the spread that I use is an unsophisticated old Moody's BAA industrial spread as well. Give me, I was way so long on my sabbatical. Give me an update on spreads. Have we given away here? No, they're going down. Just basically. a wicked tight. The idea is the extra <clears throat> premium that yeah. people uh, request to own riskier securities over benchmark treasuries. It's gone down. And this just follows that, the rally that we've seen in it's equity markets. It follows the data markets. that I see on my screen here. Yeah. And it follows the fact that even as defaults pick up, they're not expected to go up that much because yeah. you are seeing companies that yeah. have already refinanced, so they're not paying the higher rates and are in pretty good shape. You will have to see. Right now, what we see is uh, Standard & Poor's 500 up two-tenths of a percent. You know, I think it's really interesting, Tom, what Mark Zandi was saying about the forward-looking indicators being the surveys that call 100 people or 1,000 people and get some sort of indication Classic of where Zandy. they're at. Yep. How much can we get an actual read of accuracy from these? Is this really the I best never, day that we have, or are we just totally in the dark? That's textbook Mark Zandi, and he's 100 percent correct, and I'm hugely suspect about them. It's, I, I just, have you ever been called? No. Has anybody ever gone, well, so what do you think of real GDP this week? I've never had anybody ever no. call me. Or, or ask no. about how I feel. Although a lot of uh, <clears throat> surveys, at least more politically inclined ones, say that people feel the inflation story more than they feel the strong economy story. So it's a, it's a split kind of sentiment uh, feel that we're looking at right now. In the meantime, you're seeing the housing market remain really strong. I've been watching that in particular at a time when this was supposed to be the first one to fall, and it hasn't. It's actually bottomed. I, I think so many have been so wrong in the last seven months. You know, John was brilliant about this uh, uh, two years ago and that he was trying to get out to March 31 to make his annual review. This year, I think we're getting out to June 30th, or dare I say September 30th, to get a view on 2023. I mean, it's just flat out not there. There's no other way to put it. Have you gotten out of triple leverage all cash? <clears throat> no, I'm not. And what's really, you know, I am going to watch Apple and Amazon this week. I've got an odd lot order. I think it's for Amazon. I can't, my brokers, my, my financial advisors. It. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, 10 shares, or should we go 12 shares? And, you know. No, I haven't made the first purchase. No, I just, just can't do it. Well, look at the yield I'm getting. I mean, I you're talking 15% gross after 2 and 20 payout. Net clean. I mean, it's pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, well, there you go. That's your pitch. It's 10.35%. Money in the bank. Good morning. Bloomberg Surveillance, we say good morning. Lisa Bramwitz and Tom King. John Farrell on assignment right now, getting ready for the 9 o'clock 
uh, hour. There's a lift to the market. I'm going to call. There's a little bit of a bid here, Lisa. I mean, I know it's Somnol at Monday. We're waiting for data, waiting for economics, waiting for earnings, particularly on Thursday. But but to me, there's a little bit of oomph to the market. Yeah, well, people are trying to uh, get in back in love with things that were beaten up pretty significantly during the pandemic. And I want to give you just a couple examples of that. Wayfair, which had a high uh, share price of $345.47 back in 2021. Yes, it is $78.55, but it's up 7.5% because it was upgraded by Piper Sandler, saying that they're basically uh, on the cusp of driving sustained EBITDA profitability. It, it, have you done Wayfair ever? No, I, I mean, haven't. I, I, I've looked. I, I just don't get it. Well, it's a furniture uh, shipping company, yeah. which I guess now as people are uh, finding that their homes are worth something again. <clears throat> Sweet Green also, those shares up uh, more than 7% as they're getting upgraded uh, right. to by Pepper Sandler. Anyway, it's just sort of interesting to see. And you're still seeing gains ahead yeah. of uh, the Thursday earnings with Amazon and Apple. We'll have to see here. And, of course, Apple and Amazon front and center here with a little 190. I didn't realize Apple was there. I was on sabbatical and, yeah. you know, up, up. In a way, this is a joy. Her name is Allison Schrager. She worked with Glenn Hubbard at Columbia, where she took her uh, PhD. But far more than that, over the years, she's been one of the most acute students of American behavioral economists. She has a little book, which is a glorious book. An economist walks into a brothel, I'm blushing, and other <laughs> unexpected places to understand risk. And what you need to know in the book cover is, and on radio you can't see this, but she goes to the heart of the matter with a bell curve. It's, it's tough to see there, but it's, it's there, trust me. A bell curve, which is like the high school class height of your curve, and that's the artificial world that we live in, and there's a lot more going on with that. Allison Schrager joins us this morning. You start with Peter Bernstein. Mm -hmm. I was honored that he wrote an afterword for my book. Peter Bernstein wrote the book of risk, uncertainty, Against the Gods. You lead with the wonderful work of Peter Bernstein. How do you extend beyond Against the Gods with an economist walks into a brothel? Well, I mean, you can't really extend beyond it. I think that was a beautiful book because it just shows how risk <coughs> management um, really changed our relationship with risk, it became something that didn't just happen to us. It was something we could measure and try to manage and control. And I, I don't know if I could extend what he did, but my goal with this book was really to popularize it further because, I mean, it's a beautiful book, but it's an intense read and was to sort of <coughs> do for what Freakonomics maybe did for Applied Micro uh, to do something similar similar for financial economics, which I think a lot of people don't realize, even in economics, is the study of risk and risk management. I mean, Steve Levitt, uh, with Freakonomics, changed the world. You take it by anecdote to anecdote. Give us the one anecdote. Probably stay away from the brothel, <laughs> where I'm going to blush here on radio. Mm -hmm. But give us an anecdote within your book that explains how naive we are mm -hmm. about risk and uncertainty. Well, I think my favorite story. I mean, I also realized I needed to actually go and report these things myself because I didn't have the research uh, career that Steve Levitt did. So my favorite was probably going to a risk management conference for big wave surfers, um, where th I saw, you know, we sat in a windowless conference room, but they're all in board shorts and tank tops. And we had one of the most sophisticated conversations I've ever had about the role of technology and risk, about how we develop these new risk mitigation technologies, um, be it options or swaps or anything. And that really gives us an ability to feel like we're reducing risk, but often it introduces new risks or encourages us to take bigger risks. That's exactly where I was going to go. Is there a question around how accurate some of these risk measuring devices are in markets that have gotten fairly divorced from you know, the t-shirt and shorts of going out and making sure you don't wipe out in a wave and then die? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the challenges is I have another chapter that actually turned out to be quite timely about the movie industry and about how difficult it is to predict what movies are going to be successful. Because, I mean, all these models rely on data. And if the world changed, like, say, post-pandemic, do we have any data that's useful? Because, as I said, risk is a really measurement of uncertainty. And uncertainty is just we have no idea what's going to happen. Risk is an informed guess of what's going to happen. But if our guesses become less accurate, then, you know, they could honestly lead us astray sometimes. So dovetail that into the moment that we're in, where a lot of people have come on this show and said there are a lot of risks out there, but right now it's looking better. And oh yeah, every time you've tried to bet against the momentum, mm -hmm. you've gotten 
in Wall Street parlance, your face ripped off. So at what point do you just sort of ignore the feeling that there is risk out there and lean into it, right? I mean, sort of where does this leave us in today's moment? Well, I mean, I'm an efficient markets person. As I said, I, I write in the book about the, you know, the time I worked at DFA, which really uh, got me working with Gene Fama and Ken French. And I think that is part of the risk management, I guess, science is accepting, you know, efficient markets is just really all it says is you can't predict the market. And all the data you have is what you have, and it's not <coughs> perfect. So don't sort of think you can time things, right. but just hope you can manage the risks that you can. Back into your book, you have McChrystal mentioning, uh, General McChrystal mentioning his joy in your book, and you put McMaster front and center, not the McMaster of Trump, but the McMaster of battle tactician mm -hmm. uh, for America in the deserts of the, of the Middle East. A lot of the people watching and listening to this look at the investment world right now is a war. Mm -hmm. How do you take war, risk, and uncertainty and bring it over to not losing money in the market? Well, I think that that chapter is about uncertainty, and the only real hedge you have against uncertainty is liquidity. But liquidity comes at a huge cost. So that would be the equivalent of really sort of keeping your money in cash. Triple leveraged all cash. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think in, in war too, and in terms of our military, keeping a flexible uh, military that can go with punches is also incredibly expensive, which is why probably we tend to fall back on that. So I think, you know, you have to think about how much does flexibility <clears throat> under uncertainty matter to you and how much do you really need because, you know, there are trade-offs with it. And there's also a question about how much the broader Wall Street economist makes it into the room of the boardroom mm -hmm. of some of these industries and companies that you're talking about. And we've been talking a lot about building in redundancies to avoid supply chain disruptions mm -hmm. akin to what we saw during the pandemic. How much is that the risk mitigation kind of technique that an increasing number of, of industries are, are turning to, or, or are they looking to financial instruments and other kinds of uh, perhaps cheaper, more efficient ways? Well. I think, you know, one, I'm, I'm now working on a new book about our myths about risk. And I think I, one of the myths I didn't go with, but I was always thinking about is risk reward. Because I think we, you know, in finance, it's sort of this central truth that you take more risk, you get more reward, but you risk more loss. And I think the economy is now sort of sort of suffering from sort of forgetting that. Because, you know, when we talk about de-risking the economy or having more redundancies or reshoring, I think people forget that that comes with a serious cost. And it could be higher inflation in the future. It could just <coughs> mean, you know, a less dynamic economy. So it might mean uh, sort of less risk around very particular shocks we saw around the pandemic, but it could introduce new ones or just have slower growth in the future. Has financialization of a lot of industries, and I'm thinking of, for example, <coughs> uh, what people say about oil mm -hmm. uh, and the oil market, has it distorted the ability to measure risk and reward as efficiently as it used to? Well, I would expect it make it easier, right? Because we have more data. We have more <coughs> instruments to measure risk. So, I mean, on the one hand, it could. But on the other hand, it also might make it easier and sort of make it easier to measure risk. Page five. You dive into and research the moonlit, the moonlight bunny ranch. Uh -huh. That's your brothelnomics? Yeah. What, pray tell, for radio, TV, and our family audience, mm -hmm. can you tell us about an economist, Schrager, walking into a brothel and seeing brothelnomics? Well, it wasn't what I expected when I started my career. Um, but, um, you know, I got invited there for uh, a, a story about negotiation skills. And, really? Yeah. Um, turns out they have a, a rather extensive negotiation program, which, training program, which I went through. It was very helpful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do go on. We'll extend this, blow the break, tell Pharaoh he's not open to the nine. Continue, please. <laughs> so, but while I was going through the negotiation training program, I was talking to all the women about what they charge for different services. And you found that, like any other industry, there's a premium on risk. Um, and certainly, uh, that's how services are largely priced, in, uh, even mm -hmm. in sex work. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, that, I guess that's what I was exploring there, is right. really getting a feel on pricing. Right. Okay, okay, the, the control room just said, that's enough, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Allison Thank Schrager you. with a really wonderful uh, book. An economist walks into a brothel. You can see it to learn more about brothelnomics as well. It's like Steve Levitt's Freakonomics. I'm honored to say I did the first interview with Professor Levitt at Chicago on Freakonomics. And when we did that interview, nobody knew how big that book would be. Nobody had a clue. Yeah, I think that's fascinating, by the way. I mean, everybody in their life measures risk <clears throat> and reward in different ways. Right. And so when you talk about whether it's sex work or whether right. it's, you know, 
riding a 40 foot surf, wave. Surf, yeah, yeah surf, exactly. Whatever. It's more uh, yeah. visceral kind of risk, perhaps. Yeah. I'll put this out on Twitter. I'm going to put out Alison Schrager's book, An Economist Walks Into a Brothel with the great Peter Bernstein and Against the Gods as uh, well. A green on the screen, a modest lift to the markets here on a quiet Monday. This week, more than entertaining. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. Thank you.